Uh, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the fifth meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. As usual, can I remind members to switch off their phones or tablets, etc., at least put them in a mode that doesn't interfere with the proceedings. Um, the first item on our agenda is to invite Liam Kerr, MSP, to declare any relevant interests. And welcome to the committee, Liam. Thank you, convener. Uh, I refer to my register of interests, but in particular, I think for good order, I'll highlight I am a director and employee of Trinity Care Limited, which is a provider of legal services. Uh, I own a flat in Edinburgh from which I receive rents. Uh, and finally, I own a very small number of shares in Aberdeen Community Energy, uh, which is a community group which has installed a community hydroelectric turbine in Tilliedron in Aberdeen. Thank you for that, Liam, and very much warmly welcome you to the committee and looking forward to working with you. That gives me the chance also to express the committee's um, thanks to Dean Lockhart for the time he was on the committee and his contribution to our proceedings. So that takes us to the next item on the agenda, agenda is to decide whether to take item five in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to take evidence from two individuals who have been nominated for appointment to the Scottish Fiscal Commission by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution. I welcome to the meeting Professor Alistair Smith and David Wilson. Now, members will have received copies of the Cabinet Secretary's letter of nomination, along with the candidate's application forms, which have been redacted to remove any personal data. Members have also received copies of the selection criteria, along with a note um, by the clerk setting out the procedural arrangements for the nominations. Um, but before we move to questions, I wonder whether either or both of you, the nominees, would like to make any opening statement. Uh, 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 just uh, very briefly, uh, I have a, a long-standing interest in, um, in, in how fiscal rules uh, help guide an economy. Uh, I've got a, a broad-based interest in, in public policy issues, um, and, um, and I, have, I have very considerable experience uh, running a, a medium-sized university and all the challenges involved in that. Uh, and more recently, I've, I, I, I now work with the Competition and Markets Authority, which involves, um, first of all, the detailed um, scrutiny of competition and regulation cases. Uh, and secondly, uh, 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 as I see the very interesting interaction between uh, the, the, the members of the, the competition panel of the, the CMA and the professional staff, so the, the interaction between uh, commissioners, if you like, who come from a background that's relevant to the work of the commission and the professional staff of the commission uh, of the CMA uh, is, is one that uh, I, I've learned a great deal from about how to, how to interact with professional staff. I also, through uh, having served on a number of peer review bodies, uh, as well as on the CMA, have got a broad-based experience of working with bodies which advise governments uh, but are independent of the government. And uh, so I, I'm, I have a great deal of interest and experience in what independence means and how it gets safeguarded and what its importance is. OK. David? Um, thank you for the opportunity to um, make a, a very brief opening statement. Uh, I'm sure we'll go through the, um, the criteria for, for the role, but just in terms of um, an overall picture. Um, I currently am Executive Director of the International Public Policy Institute at Strathclyde University, where we're very much trying to develop a, 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 an overall uh, big picture of assessment of some of the, the challenges that are facing Scotland, the UK and, and internationally and draw together the expertise that, that exists within Strathclyde um, on many of the issues that uh, I think are relevant both to this committee and more specifically to the, the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Um, my background, uh, as you know from the, from the application, I, I worked for many years um, in um, well, initially in the UK government and then in the Scottish government as, as a civil servant, initially as an economist and then more recently as a, a senior civil servant covering a range of, of policy areas. Um, I hope that experience provides a, a very strong 
grounding in working in public life and extensive experience of, of, of work within Scottish uh, public policy issues, particularly economic um, policy issues. Um, and that, to me, gives a, a strong grounding for, for working in, uh, in, the, um, in the area of, of fiscal uh, issues. Uh, happy to cover more detailed points uh, going forward, but uh, that was the, uh, an introduction. Thank you both. I'd like to just put a question to, to both of you, actually. I note uh, from your respective CVs that you both have extensive experience in a number of roles in the fields of finance and economics. And I, I wonder, could you please tell the committee about any specific experience you have in respect of production of, an, of analysis of forecasts? And please feel free, whoever wants to start that off. I'll go first. Uh, I, I, I'm not a, I, I am an economist. Uh, I'm not a forecaster in the, the narrow sense of being someone who's, who... I'm not a macroeconomist concerned with the production of, of macroeconomic forecasts. Um, but, uh, but I do have a um, very considerable experience of policy analysis. And, I, and, and as I see the, the, the work of the Commission, um, it is as important to have an understanding of broader interactions between policies and the budget uh, as uh, to, to have a background in, in technical forecasting. Uh, and also, that's the more technical aspects of the job. And it's useful to have commissioners who, who, have a, who, who know quite a bit of technical stuff, but in the end, it's, or not in the end, it's, a, it's the initial responsibility of the, the professional staff to have the the expertise in areas like technical forecasting, and for the commissioners to have sufficient, indeed, a sufficiently deep understanding, they can lead and challenge and guide. Uh, but, uh, but that's a kind of interaction between the members of the commission and staff that I think can be very productive if it works well, and you don't necessarily need all the technical expertise in the, in the, person of the, the persons of the commissioners. Thank you. David? I think like uh, Professor Smith, I, I was very clear in, in my application and the discussion at the, at the interview. I'm not putting myself forward as a, as a professional academic macroeconomist. That's not my background, but I, I do have ex extensive experience working in government on a broad range of economic matters. I, I was thinking earlier that uh, it's now 30 years ago, starting off, you know, for, first role working for uh, Ian Lang at the time on, on ec economic issues. Um, and throughout that period, working on um, the Smart Successful Scotland strategy, the work around the, uh, the government's uh, economic strategy during um, the, the period um, after 2007. Um, much of that involved quite extensive assessment of um, economic data, trying, seeking to draw out the, the, the major issues and understand uh, w what was going on amidst the very uncertain uh, ma macroeconomic picture. So, extensive experience of using, assessing and you know, implementing the insights from technical forecasts. Um, and w where I, I do have more experience of, of more detailed forecasting was work I did for, for about uh, three years, again some time ago now as a, as a transport economist modelling of traffic flows and information um, on that, which gave a, a solid grounding on use of um, statistical uh, um, models to uh, draw out the, the, the important uh, issues on, on, on transport flows. So sufficient experience to scrutinise, assess um, and validate the technical forecasts. Um, but I, I'm very clear, I'm, I'm not a technical uh, forecaster by trade. Thank you. Murdo? Thank you. Kamina, um, Professor Smith, I was, I was interested in reading something that you had said about your application where you say that you're interested in long-run fiscal sustainability and the importance of not being misled by public sector accountancy rules. Who do you think is being misled by public sector accountancy rules? Um, well, it's e easier to talk in, in the past, uh, so I'll, I'll do that. I, I think in, in the past, the UK government has made fiscal decisions which have been driven uh, by statistical consider by accounting considerations rather than long run economic considerations of which the best is is pfi uh, so uh, the, the, 
a, a lot of, I mean, there are arguments, there are very strong arguments in favour of public-private partnerships, not at all opposed to them. Uh, but there's little doubt in my mind that in, in the past, and maybe even now, uh, some governments have embraced PFI because it looks better on the books. It doesn't show up as, as borrowing. And therefore, when you look at fiscal issues, you say, oh, the, 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 the deficit isn't growing, we're not building up repayment obligations for future taxpayers, but a PFI builds up repayment ob obligations for future taxpayers every bit as much as, as government borrowing. So uh, I think it'd be good when governments make an assessment of the appropriate ways to fund uh, public investment, that that assessment is done in a way that isn't biased by the fact that one future burden shows up on the books and the other future burden is, is rather hidden away. And I, and I think the, the OBR, in, in, in as where the second leg of the, the work which it currently does, has done very good work in looking not just at the, the costs of PFI, uh, but also the costs of the long-term costs of the English system of student support. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, actually, and public sector pensions are the other area where there can be a very big long-term burden that isn't quite as explicit as, uh, as those fiscal burdens which are borne through borrowing. That's, that's the general area in which I think it's important for governments to be guided by uh, statistics that give a fair picture. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a very helpful response. One of the things this committee has looked at recently is the Scottish Government's um, non-profit distributing model on some of the issues that's led to with the, the reclassification uh, of uh, European accountancy rules and what's that meant for the, the public sector finances. Uh, so do you think we're getting better at understanding these accountancy rules that you refer to across governments? Um, Yes, we are getting better, but uh, but they're very they're very strong pressures. Uh, they're very strong pressures that pull in the opposite direction. So governments continue to be tempted uh, by short-term cash flow issues rather than looking at at long-term sustainability issues. And uh, uh, to take a UK government example, some of the things which are said about the sale of public assets, uh, some of the things which were said by, the, the, by Mr. Osborne as Chancellor of the Exchequer, that you know, if we, the more Lloyds Bank shares we sell, uh, the more we're paying down the debt. Well, no, uh, again, this is not a comment about whether selling Lloyds Bank shares is a good thing or a bad thing. It may well be a good thing, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't pay down the debt because the public sector is swapping one financial asset, Lloyds Bank shares, for another which is cash in the, in the Treasury. Uh, it doesn't improve the long-term fiscal position. Uh, so so there's, still, there's still a long way to go. Interesting. Okay, and, and I mean, finally, Camino, would you see your role, therefore, as a, a, a commissioner to try and shine some light on these areas and make sure the, the government's going in the right direction? It depends on how the remit of the commission develops. Uh, I, I, we, as I uh, understand it, we've, we, we have a very well-defined task at the moment to do with the scrutiny of budgets. We're at the very, uh, we're at the very beginning of that task. It's very important that the Commission build up credibility and do its initial job well. Uh, in due course, it's not for us, but uh, for politicians to decide how the remit of the the Commission should develop. Personally, given what I've just <laughs> disclosed about my interests, uh, I obviously would have some personal enthusiasm for, for taking uh, uh, a strong role if the work of the, of the Commission developed in that direction. But it's not for me to determine how the, the, the role of the Commission should develop, except to say I'm very strongly of the view that we need to do our current task well and establish our record before we move on to, to wider tasks, however attractive they may be. Thank you. James? Okay, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, I just want to follow up on the Convener's initial question about um, forecasts. More than ever, the, 
the, the importance of these forecasts is absolutely crucial because it's not just a case of a look ahead to the future. The forecasts are going to be used in terms of the block grant adjustment and will ultimately feed into the actual monies that have been allocated to the public purse. So it's crucial that the forecasts are accurate and we as a finance committee and parliament in general have confidence in that. Uh, you both acknowledged that you're not technical forecasters. How can you, and you've, there's obviously a team uh, underneath that works on the, the, the detail of the forecast, how can you demonstrate to the committee that you will have enough in-depth and hands-on knowledge in order to be able to demonstrate that you'll be able to interrogate the forecasting process uh, and ensure the integrity and the accuracy of those numbers? I think the important point, perhaps two points to, to recognise at, at the outset is uh, clearly the, the Commission is not starting from uh, you know, a blank sheet of paper. There's been extensive work uh, already done um, within government in terms of building up the modelling uh, capability to um, develop uh, f forecasts and assessments across the range of different uh, devolved taxes and, and, and clearly on uh, GDP uh, modelling um, as well. Um, that will transition uh, to, to the, the Commission. Um, likewise, and secondly, I think the Commission has done has had an excellent start in terms of producing the reports which it has um, tabled in, in its scrutiny of the um, both uh, the previous year and uh, you know the, the coming year's budget. So clearly, building on on a strong start. Uh, what that has done is identified is precisely because of the importance of uh, forecasts as, as part of the, the, the overall fiscal framework. It, there is now even greater importance to get the, get the, um, the assessments um, as authoritative and as, as um, clear and appropriate a judgment on those forecasts as can possibly be the case like all forecasts you know the, the accuracy they can never they, they will never be 100 percent accurate no forecast uh, ever will be but they need to carry authority and um, be transparent in how they're uh, developed um, and i think ca carry uh, a, an, an authority that they are the best forecasts uh, and the most impartial forecasts that, that, that are available um, Along with uh, Riz Smith, I, I hope to be able to make a, a very strong contribution to that alongside the other commissioners, um, al along with the team that are being built up um, in, the, in the Fiscal Commission. Um, and I think perhaps particularly what that will mean is um, drilling down and getting, um, as perhaps we called, inside the models that um, have been developed and are being further uh, enhanced, identifying the very granular and detailed issues that will potentially cause um, uncertainty about the, 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 the forecasts going forward. Um, and the Commission has already made, a, made a, a, a strong start at doing that. Issues around the Aberdeen economy and how the impact of the, um, the challenging situation facing the oil and gas industry has been clearly you know, one key issue that's been looked at, assessing the, uh, the current uncertainties and quite considerable lack of data that exists on some areas that the, that the Commission will have to take a judgment on. This work is underway and I think what we can bring to that very strongly is um, shaping and building the information base, the data, the um, understanding that is available on each of, of those issues. Just, can I just follow up specifically on that? You spoke an awful lot about the process there and the process is important and you spoke about how you would you would drill down as a commissioner. Can you maybe give a, a more practical example of how you would how you would see you are doing that? Because it's it's important for us as a committee that um, we've got confidence that you don't simply see your role as rubber stamping the forecasts that come out and rubber stamping the process. What we're interested in is how how you can interact on that and how you can, as you said, drill down. But could you give a, maybe a more practical example of that? Perhaps give one example of, of particular uh, in, interest to me. Um, perhaps building on the the, the, the 
work that the Commission has already started around the, the Aberdeen property market uh, and by implication the Aberdeen um, and surrounding area labour market as well. I think there was a particular issue which I think Margot Fraser picked up in the, the session um, both with um, Lady Susan Rice and, and the, the other commissioners and also with Robert Choate about how um, Scottish earnings um, may develop, over, well, how they are currently developing and how they will develop uh, going forward. Uh, and perhaps the, the particular issue about how the, the Scottish labour market and, and trends and the, the current situation in the Scottish labour market will impact on future forecasts and future outturns of, uh, of um, in income tax take. I mean, that's a particular issue which has been recognised by the Commission as an area that there may be an emerging um, you know, distinction between earnings forecasts in Scotland and the rest of the UK, which is perhaps the critical issue uh, going forward in terms of variability of, of, of tax take, which will impact on the, on the overall Scottish budget. Uh, and it's an area that I personally would bring considerable experience of in terms of understanding the labour market processes and trends and also utilising um, the, the mechanisms, again, that we're building up of uh, consultation, dialogue with um, business organisations, um, you know, external parties, understanding the situation on the ground can greatly help to provide the, the colour and greater information on the forecasts that we will ultimately make. And if I can add to that, and, and stick with the same example of, of income tax forecasts. Income tax forecasts depend on what you can think of as classic economic forecasts of how is the Scottish economy as a whole doing. And that's, a, it's, it's important, that's important, an important part of it. But income tax forecasts are also very sensitive to the distribution of income, um, because at different points in the income distribution, different people pay very different levels of income tax. So, in, so income distribution differentials between Scotland and the UK will be part of the explanation for how the Scottish income tax revenue develops. And understanding how uh, economic performance is changing, not only in relation to the overall Scottish economy, but what, what's happening to income distribution. And we've seen over the last uh, seven or eight years, very significant changes in the, for the relative fortunes of, in different parts of the labour market. So that's an area where I have taken an interest in the past and, and where I know good work has already been done, being done uh, on uh, in the forecasts of the Scottish in Income Tax, and I'd be very keen to uh, to pursue that and, and, and scrutinise that, that kind of work and help to take it forward. No, okay. Has any other members got any other questions? Well, I, I've just got one general question at the end here. I just want, and you've talked about some of your... Ashley, you've got a question? Sorry, on you go. Um, so the criteria requires you to demonstrate an appreciation of the strategic fiscal landscape in Scotland. Can you explain what you think the main issues facing us are in the medium to long term? I think the main issue, uh, the main fiscal issue facing Scotland in the medium to long term is the same as the main issue facing uh, the UK in the medium to long term and facing all advanced economies, which is um, the, the impact of demographic change and the ageing population and the rising relative, the rising relative health and social care costs of uh, the, the older part of, of the generation. Um, and uh, that's, that's a, a very big challenge because we, all of us, um, I'm sure want to make sure that an appropriate level of resource is put into areas like health and social care. Uh, but, um, if, but balancing that need against the need to put public resources into the needs of the younger generation is, is going to be a tougher and tougher challenge. And to be frank, as we all know, we'll face politicians in all countries with tough decisions. And one of the reasons for having independent commissions like the Scottish Fiscal Commission is as a source of 
the challenge that politicians need, the pressure. You know, none of us like asking hard questions, but having people who ask you hard questions and face you with the tough decisions is a very desirable feature of a healthy political system. And I think the toughest questions are about the interaction of demography and the public finances. I very strongly agree with everything Professor Smith has said in terms of the long-term challenges. Um, just perhaps to build in it and add some comments, you know, clearly um, Scotland and the UK face a very uncertain picture in terms of uh, economic performance and the economic developments over the, the, the coming years with the prospect of, of uh, Brexit in particular, how that will play out over, over the, the, the coming periods, not, not time to go into now, but that, that clearly adds a level of uncertainty to what is perhaps already a considerable uncertainty about how the, um, the post-recession uh, um, re recovery is, is developing. But just perhaps to add, add a couple of points in terms of the, the key issues for the Commission and all, all, all of that is, um, clearly it's, it, what happens in the wider UK picture is clear that, that what will happen will happen. But the, the two areas that I think will be of considerable importance to the Commission as it goes forward um, is firstly developing the understanding and the assessment of how any potential differential economic performance between Scotland and the UK will both play out in terms of forecasts, because it, clearly if there is a differential economic performance, um, then the Commission will be, uh, its statutory duties are, are, are such that we will need to be forecasting that as it's happening. So the Commission plays a crucial role um, in recognising as early as possible and understanding how GDP in Scotland may develop vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the, the, the UK. So understanding economic performance because of how critically important that is to the wider fiscal framework and the differential um, funding that may become available to the Scottish, Scottish Government. So differential economic performance and understanding the, the reasons why is critical to the Commission. Um, and secondly, in thinking about our forecasts, what will also be crucially important um, is the, the sense of where the Scottish Government to continue to take uh, decisions in terms of its, uh, its discretionary tax powers, um, how that might play out in terms of um, tax take, clear issues with the additional rate of tax are already a, a live issue, and having the capability to uh, properly forecast the chosen policy of, of the Scottish Government will be a key issue for the Commission going forward. Okay, I just one last ask. Any other questions from the members? No, well, Ash, you covered the area I wanted to go into anyway. Um, well, this is obviously an unusual appointment process. It must be the largest recruitment panel I think anyone's ever been in front of. <laughs> so, but, but I thank both witnesses uh, for, for, for answering our questions today. Uh, the committee will now consider the, the evidence that you presented to us in private under Agenda Item 5 before we publish a short report setting out our recommendations to Parliament. I thank you very much and I briefly suspend the meeting to allow a changeover of witnesses.
Okay, colleagues. Um, at, at the, the second item on today's agenda is to begin our consideration of the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill at Stage 1 by taking evidence from the Scottish Government Bill team. I therefore welcome to the meeting Scottish Government officials uh, James McClellan, who is the head of Devolved Taxes and the Bill team leader, Mike Stewart, who is the Bill manager, and John St Clair, who is the lead solicitor for the Bill and the senior principal legal officer. Now, members will have received copies of the bill at supporting documents, along with the spice briefing. Um, but before we move to questioning of the government officials, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. McClellan if he wants to make an, an opening statement. Convener, thank you for the opportunity to make a short opening statement on the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. The devolution of air passenger duty formed one of the recommendations of the Smith Commission report published on the 27th of November 2014. Paragraph 86 of the report recommended that the power to charge tax on air passengers leaving Scottish airports will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. This proposal and the others contained in the Smith Commission report were taken forward in the Scotland Act 2016, which received royal assent on the 23rd of March last year. Following the commencement of section 17 of the Act, the Scottish Parliament now has the power to legislate for a tax which will replace APD in Scotland. The programme for government, uh, in, in the programme for government, the Scottish Government announced that a bill for a replacement for APD would be introduced in the first year of this parliamentary session. It also reaffirmed the Scottish Government's commitment to delivering a 50% reduction in the overall burden of ADT by the end of the Parliament and to abolishing the tax when resources allow. As the Committee is aware, we published a policy consultation on the 14th of March last year. The consultation generated a range of views and we received 160 responses in total. We are grateful to all who contributed their time and input into the process and we've worked carefully to refine our legislative proposals, reflecting the responses received. In addition to the public consultation, the Scottish Government established a stakeholder forum, which is chaired by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution, to provide expert input into the development of our policy and legislative proposals on ADT. The Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill itself was introduced on the 19th of December 2016. It makes provisions for air departure tax a tax to be charged on the carriage of chargeable passengers on chargeable aircraft by air from airports in Scotland. The tax is to be payable by aircraft operators. Under the terms agreed between the Scottish and UK governments in the fiscal framework, APD will cease to apply in Scotland from April 2018, and if the bill is enacted, ADT will replace it from that date. The bill comprises 42 sections, five parts and three schedules, which establishes ADT, sets out the key concepts underlying the tax, including identifying chargeable passengers and chargeable aircraft. It also sets out the tax rate structure and rules that determine which flights are to be treated as connected for ADT purposes. It provides for the administrative matters relating to the payment, collection and management of the tax and finally it makes further provisions including in relation to subordinate legislation. Details on exemptions, tax bans and tax rate amounts are not included in the bill and will be delivered at, late, at a later date. Section 8 and Section 10 of the bill make provisions for the Scottish Government to set exemptions, tax bans and tax rate amounts through subordinate legislation. This approach on tax bans and tax rates is consistent with the approach adopted in relation to the other devolved tax in Scotland. Revenue Scotland, Scotland's tax authority for the devolved taxes, will be responsible for the collection and management of ADT, as it has been since the 1st of April 2015 for LBTT and Scottish landfill tax. There is a financial memorandum which accompanied the bill, and this sets out the estimated costs to the Scottish administration, giving details of the impacts on the Scottish budget, uh, and also to the costs for Revenue Scotland and the Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, in both administering and forecasting the tax. It also demonstrates that the Scottish Government is committed to providing sufficient and appropriate resources to support the new tax powers. The Scottish Government is also currently undertaking a strategic environmental assessment. The key remaining steps of the SEA process is to publicly consult for a 12-week period on the tax rate amount proposals, and this will be accompanied by an environmental report outlining the results of the environmental assessments. We will provide further details on the timing of this in due course. We look forward to considering and reflecting on the evidence which the committee will gather 
at stage one of the bill process and to discussing our legislative proposals with you further this morning. Thank you. Thank you, James, for giving us that comprehensive overview um, from the government officials' perspective. Um, I note that the government has consulted on the proposals to replace air passenger duty and published an analysis of the consultation responses. Can you please summarise the main points that were made in the response to the consultation bill and explain, if you can, how the consultations helped shape the bill that was currently before us? Um, the, the, first, first of all, uh, we, we um, received a substantial number of uh, responses to the public consultation um, in comparison to the, the, pre the two previous devolved taxes. Um, so we were you know, very grateful for the views expressed during that consultation. Um, I, th I think one of the, the, one of the key uh, f you know, findings from the consultation was the fact that um, whilst the structure um, of the policy consultation paper was uh, predominantly focused on the actual structure of the tax and how it would be collected and managed um, by Revenue Scotland, um, there was a strong um, majority of, of views expressed during that consultation on the Scottish Government's wider proposals on the tax rate mounts as well, um, on, in particular on the uh, proposed 50% reduction in the overall burden by the end of the current Parliament and to eventually abolish it when resources allow. And that drove a large number of the responses to particular questions, um, not, notwithstanding those views which um, pre predominantly were driven by individual members of the public, but there were uh, you know, a large number of organisations as well who um, opposed those, those proposals. Um, for those who actually responded to the specific questions in the consultation on the structure of the tax, um, there was an overwhelming consensus just at, generally at the high level on retaining the, the, uh, the same structure and the same sort of administration arrangements um, for UK APD. Um, and that was driven by um, not just airlines and the, you know, the aviation sector and the travel sector, but, but other organisations as well, um, even those who uh, you know, perhaps objected to the to the proposal to reduce the tax. The you know the actual views on um, changing anything substantially in relation uh, from the UK tax. That, that you know there, there wasn't a you know there, there was a minority of views expressed with you know some different suggestions on how the tax might be uh, d collected in a slightly different way. But um, the the key message that we took from the responses we received. Um, was was uh, you know to, to look very strongly at how the UK currently does the tax. Um, in addition to the you know the consultation responses, we have also engaged uh, extensively with our stakeholder forum, which James mentioned. Uh, we established that in uh, on the sixth of August, twenty fifteen, and it's met five times so far, and we'll we'll continue to, continue to engage with that um, group as well as part of our overall stakeholder engagement approach. Um, and again. The, the strong consensus from there was to model the, the structure of the tax and the, the administration of the tax very heavily on that. So going into the specifics of how the consultation responses uh, you know, uh, informed those views, given the fact that that was the overwhelming consensus, that, that has largely driven um, a lot of uh, the, you know, the, the policy discussions and the policy analysis, which has led to the content of the bill. Um, itself. So in the, you know, in the bill that w we've got, um, there's, uh, you know, the the section one of the bill, part one of the bill, is just entirely consistent with the powers that have been devolved. Parts two are, you know, defined chargeable passenger and what, as a chargeable aircraft. Again, those are um, exactly the same as the UK APD definitions. Um, and in relation to the exemptions, which I'm sure will probably come on to a, a later point, you know, they, we're still considering our overall approach to those in, in the round um, and some further technical and legal details on those. But um, you know, again, there is a, a sort of large degree of consensus on those exemptions as well. Um, on the, the the tax banding, tax bans are not not in the bill as well. Um, we again, we will we'll propose to bring forward uh, our detail on those at a later date. But again, the strong consensus was keeping with the two band UK APD approach, which essentially sees band A is kind of short haul flights, which is all those uh, within Europe and most of Northern Africa all the way up to and including uh, Libya, but not, not Egypt. And then band B is any other types of flights. So we're still reflecting on the banding structure because we see that that's, um, you know, that's a crucial part of the tax rate amount decisions that, we'll, that, that, you know, that we're doing analysis on at the moment. Um, and again, further detail on tax rate amounts will be brought forward at a later date. Um, 
Moving on to the, the, the administration of the tax, um, a, lot, a lot of the proposals we've used, we've, we've obviously got the Revenue Scotland Tax Powers Act 2014, which provides the general framework for the collection and management of devolved taxes in Scotland. So the starting point for um, how ADT would be collected and managed was to reflect on the views expressed in the consultation responses, plus our wider engagement with stakeholders and discussions with HMRC as well um, and other bodies. And um, to, to then look at how what legislative changes would be required to, to introduce those. So part four of the bill that's introduced and um, schedule two um, contains uh, further legislative, le legislative provision which was considered necessary for EDT, which wasn't already covered in the Revenue Scotland Tax Powers Act. So, you know, there's, there's um, concepts of registering for the tax, um, you know, sort of in advance. There's concepts of, you know, making a tax return and paying tax at the same time as making a tax return. Um, and uh, we've, we've taken specific uh, parts of the collection and management of the tax, which are specific to air, UK air passenger duty, like the concept of having tax representatives, um, like having uh, uh, revenue protection measures in place for uh, handling agents and taking into account the difficulties that some uh, aircraft operators experience with their accounting systems, particularly smaller airlines. Um, allowing special accounting schemes to be applied to Revenue Scotland, etc. So again, the, the views expressed in the consultation paper were almost, almost overwhelmingly in support of all of those types of arrangements. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. It's of answer. Um, in turn, you've explained in some areas where the policy and the, the direction the bill follows what happens in air passenger duty. Is there any particular areas you, you could point out to us where there's, we're, doing it slight, we're doing it differently in terms of the air departure tax compared with the existing legislation for air passenger duty. So on the detail that's in the bill, um, there's just only a, really a small handful um, of differences. Uh, one of the, the overriding uh, things I should say is that the actual legislation, if you actually look at the legislation for air departure tax in the bill with the equivalent um, UK APD provisions, which are largely in the Finance Act 1994, um, the legislation looks slightly different, but the actual effect of it is, is broadly the same. Um, so uh, the first key difference is in terms of the tax return. Um, I would say, in, in, in actual fact, what, uh, many of the key differences, most of the key, di key differences are just in the administration of the tax. So firstly, uh, we're, we, we have two, two uh, methods of making a tax return, a quarterly tax return um, and an occasional return. Now, the occasional return is broadly the same as the uh, provision that's in the UK tax for uh, aircraft operators, which um, sort of uh, only operate in frequent flights or, partic or at particular times of the year, where perhaps making a quarterly tax return is, is not the most efficient method of, of um, you know, uh, complying with the, the, their liabilities under the tax. Um, under APD, uh, the standard month, it's a standard monthly return, so we went for a, a quarterly return. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the key differences there. Another key difference is uh, with tax representatives, which are essentially a a, a separate uh, contracting body which the aircraft operator would enter into a contract with um, to provide uh, particular services. Um, the the uh, UK APD has a requirement that any aircraft operator which doesn't have a, a, a business establishment or, um, or other fixed establishment within the UK, they are required to have a, a tax representative um, we considered that in the course of developing the bill and um, considered that in order to uh, ensure that we're fully complying with, with EU law, um, we've changed that uh, geographical requirement to any aircraft operator who doesn't have a, a business establishment or other fixed establishment within the EE, EEA, um, essentially. So that, that's uh, one, one small difference. Um, other than that, there's not too many differences. I, th I think those, are, those, those would be the key differences. Uh, Murdo, I think you had a supplementary. Yes, in this area. thank you, Commissioner. Just a follow-up to that question from the, the Convener. I mean, you pointed out some, some, if I may say, some fairly minor technical differences. Is it fair to say, though, that in effect what you're doing is just replicating the existing UK system in Scotland, albeit you're giving it a different name, you're calling it the air departure tax instead of air passenger duty, but in effect it's the same tax? 
if you if you uh, can, comparing the the provision the effect of the provisions of this bill and the structure of the tax that's in place at the moment, then um, in practice, once once if if that legislation is passed and put into effect, then yes, the the actual practical effect on the on on the ground and in terms of the collection of, of the tax would be uh, broadly the same. Yes. Um, that, that, that would be correct to say. Obviously, in terms of the collection and management of the tax, in terms of how Revenue Scotland makes its decisions on compliance with the tax and risk-based approach, um, that's a matter for Revenue Scotland, and that would be, uh, you know, um, that, that may well be different than how HMRC uh, collects and manages the tax. But I, I, I think the, um, the, yeah, like I say, the, the driving factor was not necessarily to, to, to just, you know, uh, from a point zero to directly just automatically assume that it would be uh, the structure of the tax would be copied right across um, we did you know uh, bring it, um, allow people to bring forward alternative proposals in the consultation paper and some did in some very sort of minor ways but given the overwhelming uh, consensus from the stakeholders um, and the consultation responses I think that you know that that was a large part in our decisions on how we've arrived at the provisions in the bill um, and yeah I, th I think yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, the early part of the evidence session, I'm going to try to concentrate on the specifics of the bill, then we can get into wider issues. So, for, I think, Adam, you've got a specific question on the bill itself. Yeah, so. Yes, please, thank you, Gouvenia. So, um, am I right in understanding that tax bans, tax rate amounts and tax exemptions are not covered in the bill? That's correct, yes. And yeah. am I right, thank you, and am I right in understanding that exemptions and tax bans and tax rate amounts are provided for currently in primary legislation with regard to APD? Uh, yes, that's that's correct. Yes, okay. and am I right um, in understanding that um, uh, in the LBTT legislation of 2013, um, exemptions for with regard to LBTT were laid out in primary legislation? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Yep. So the, why should why is this tax being treated differently? Why are these matters not on the face of the legislation but being left to ministers? Yeah, um, it, it's a it's a fair point and. Um, you know, clearly there was an overwhelming consensus from the stakeholders and from the responses to the consultation to retain the current exemptions. Um, we've, uh, we, we've provided, and with regards to exemptions, we've provided a power in um, Section 8 of the bill which allows uh, regulations to be brought forward in subordinate legislation. Um, we are considering uh, just our overall approach to exemptions in the round. There's just some further technical and legal matters which just need to be worked through. Um, I can't comment any more specifically on those, but we certainly... Um, recognise the... So, so right from your answer that the reason why these matters do not appear on the face of the bill is because you're not ready? No, it's, it's not that we're uh, not ready in terms of, um, you know, knowing our, our, our general approach at this current time. I think it's just we, uh, we've we considered that it would be best... No, no. If I'm wrong that you're not ready, what is the reason for these, uh, for these matters, bans, rates and um, uh, exemptions, not to appear on the face of the bill? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, as 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 as, as Mike uh, set out, I think we just um, we feel we want to take the opportunity of the bill process to to further consider our, our overall approach to to, uh, to 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 exemptions. I mean, as uh, in, in in terms of well, Adam, let, okay. let, let him complete his answer first. Sorry. Just, yeah, I mean, just in, in uh, to, to to reassure you, we're, uh, we we will be um, coming forward with with further details in in in, in due course, uh, and certainly well in advance of ADT coming into effect in April 2018. I'm not reassured. The reason why I'm not reassured is because what the Smith Commission Agreement says, and I quote, is that the power to charge tax on air passengers leaving Scottish airports will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, not devolved to Scottish ministers but devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So I ask again, why is the structure of this tax manifestly different from the way in which it's structured in primary legislation for the United Kingdom at the moment, and manifestly different from the way in which uh, LBTT was structured, with exemptions being on the face of the bill rather than being left to the subsequent delegated authority of ministers? So I think, I mean, the the, the, the comparison with um, uh, with the UK process uh, is, is, is is an interesting uh, is an interesting one which 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 we can look at. Obviously, in the UK, they have um, an annual finance bill which enables them uh, to have a regular process to amend primary legislation. Now, we don't have that in in in, in Scotland, uh, which is which is a, a key difference between. Uh, between, I think, the approach that we took to the ADT bill uh, and the existing legislation um, in, in, in the UK. 
Um, I mean, around. I mean, just 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 to reiterate, around around exemptions, um, we we are we are still looking at this, um, and 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 we'll, and we'll be coming forward with further details of it of, of it in due course, and, and and certainly well 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 in advance of of uh, of, of, of the bill coming into effect. Uh, that, 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 that 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 addresses the difference between this bill and current UK APD legislation, but it doesn't address the difference between this bill and this Parliament's LBTT legislation. So wh why should exemptions appear on the face of the LBTT primary legislation, i.e. enacted by this Parliament, whereas they don't appear on the face of this bill? Be uh, well, I, I think we could be uh, because of the, uh, the, the the range of responses um, that we that we had to the consultation process, I mean, Mike Mike, uh, Mike mentioned that it was uh, far more significant than than than, than, than we had uh, from the other uh, fully devolved taxes. Um, I mean, certainly there there are a range of views. We're, 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 we're considering them. I mean, I think in in, in terms of our options, so um, uh, there, there there is obviously. The option to bring forward the exemptions through uh, through secondary legislation, um, uh, but it can also be done via via amendments um, to the bill at stage two or, or, or stage three. So, so that action, what the Scottish government currently anticipates doing for itself, bringing forward government amendments to its own bill. Uh, we're still we're still considering we're still considering our options on that. Um, so it's 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 it's. it's, 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 it's I, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe it as, as our stated intent at, at, the, at the moment. I mean, it's too. It's, it's, it's too early in the bill process. Um, so it's more likely that these will be that these matters will be dealt with by delegated legislation rather than by amendments to this bill as it goes through, as things stand. We, we're, still, we're still we're still considering considering the options of exemptions. Well, well, I mean, we, we get the minister in front of us at the end of this process, and it will be a chance for him to come back and, and, and reheat these arguments I with think the minister. I I suspected you would. Um, let me just ask a supplementary then to, in, in, in that regard. In terms of the regulations or the statutory instruments that might come forward, what consultation process will you be carrying out about these matters before such instruments were to appear, and if such instruments were to appear before Parliament? Um, with regards to uh, tax bans and tax rate amounts, um, I would say that th well, th uh, we're currently in the, in the middle of a strategic environmental assessment process, which the Scottish Government is required by law to carry out, um, because the effects of um, the 50% reduction in the overall burden of the tax are considered to likely to have environmental, uh, an environmental impact. So um, before uh, the, any legislation containing the, the tax rate amounts, at, at least, um, is laid before Parliament, we'll be required to uh, publicly consult, um, and that's to over a 12-week process on those plans. So that, that is a remaining step that still needs to occur. So there will be a, a further um, opportunity on a public consultation on those tax rate amount proposals. Um, on the tax bans, um, I, th I think the, 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 the current um, thinking is, is that the tax bans uh, are kind of inextricably linked with tax rate amount proposals. Uh, the ta we set out tax rates in the bill, um, so you know the concept of a of a standard rate, um, which applies to typically economy class uh, flights, and then a, a premium rate, which applies to uh, first class business class flights, and uh, typically, and then another one, which uh, special cat special category rate, which applies to tax rates. Um, there was. Uh, you know, overwhelming consensus on the tax rates. There was a bit more of a difference of opinion on the tax bans, um, and the tax bans is a bit more of a, a sort of um, like a, a much more interrelated with the tax rate amount proposals. So um, we're currently considering the best um, approach on the tax rate amounts, and as I say, uh, there will be a further public opportunity to um, to comment on those proposals uh, before legislation can be laid before the Parliament on those tax rate amount proposals. Would you? Supplementary there as well on that. Yeah, when you go. Th thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Just on this question of of, of tax bans, just, just so we're clear, the government's current intent is, is is to replicate the existing system of a band A and band B. Is that is that correct? Again, um, I, I wouldn't be able to provide um, sort of too much detail on that at this point. Perhaps that's a, an opportunity to, to ask the the cabinet secretary when he appears. But um, I mean, essentially, that the, you know, the, the overwhelming consensus from the stakeholders is, simp is to have that two-band structure, and um, you know, the, it's a, it provides a simple and effective measure 
um, and will minimise any disruption for airlines. So that, that will be a driving focus on, on our decisions in terms of um, measuring up how efficient and convenient the, the sort of the, the tax structure is with the, the, how, how it enables us to deliver our, our sort of policy objectives for the tax on the tax rate amount proposals. Perhaps I can just ask one more question on, on bans, if I can. Was it something that the, that the government looked at, whether it would be possible to have a different band only for domestic flights within the UK, or was there any legal impediment to doing that? Yeah. Um, so that is, that is um, certainly one view that was expressed in the consultation responses. Um, I know that that's uh, one, one view that uh, Virgin Trains, for example, particularly is interested in. Um, because you know it's concerned about the impact on the the real sector if um, you know there was a reduction on on uh, air departure tax charged on flights within the UK, for example, especially where those provide a competition. So again, I, I can't um, you know it's one of the options that that we're considering and looking at. Um, I can't sort of say anything more at this point. You're not aware of a, of a legal impediment to that being done. Like uh, um, that it's one of the things that we're that we're looking at at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, specifically in the bill, again, could you question on policy issue, poly, policy memorandum, Willie? So the let's same, just link it. Same in. issue, really, that's been raised there. James, in your opening um, remarks, you were talking about um, the bill itself and why the uh, tax bans, rates, and exemptions weren't included in the bill at this stage. But I think yeah, I think I took a note of what you were saying there that that seemed to be consistent with some of the other uh, measures that we're bringing in. And you mentioned landfill tax. Could you just clarify what it was you? You said there why why we're separating the defining these these points in the bill and why we're not doing it at this stage. Yeah, I mean, so the the the, the point in there uh, that I made in the, the the opening statement was that our our, our approach to um, rates and, and and bans and setting them out through uh, subordinate legislation was was consistent with the approach that we'd taken to the uh, to the fully devolved taxes. So, um, I mean, the, the, the rationale around that is um, partly partly consistency, um, but I think the other uh, uh, another point picking up on on the exchange that we had before in terms of the differences between the uh, the, the, the Scottish and, and UK uh, approach, because obviously the the, the, the UK have their uh, have their annual finance bill, and we we don't, um, giving us more flexibility uh, in, in in terms of bringing. Uh, making changes to, to rates and bans through subordinate legislation it, it, it enables us to, I suppose, reflect on um, operational issues, other other feedback that we're that, that, that we're getting once once the tax goes goes live. The advantage, as you see it, of doing it this way in Scotland. Yes. Yeah. yeah I suppose the next question to follow up from that convener is when <laughs> when will we see the detail of this emerging? Because we're just short of a year away from bringing the new provisions in, so when will we be able to see that and when will we be able to scrutinise it? Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll be bringing um, details on that forward shortly. Uh, as, as, as I set out in the, in, in the earlier exchange, um, I mean, it, it, it'll either be through subordinate legislation, so after, after the bill itself um, is, 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 is passed. Um, I mean, certainly it's it's, um, it's, our, it's our hope to try and uh, to try and pass the bill in, in, in advance of, uh, of, of summer recess. So we'd be looking to to bring forward subordinate legislation in, in the autumn. Um, uh, the, the, the other approach is obviously via via amendments to the bill at stage two or three. Time for one more on the provisions. In the specifically about the bill before yeah. I get into yeah. the financial it's, memorandum. It's, it's specifically about the bill, there's a, there's a section in about connected flights, the connected flights rule. And I was just wondering, in, the, in light of the conversation we just had, why have we kept the detail of that in the bill, and rather than leaving that to discussion and, and consultation and review as, as it develops in Scotland? It seems to be the same provisions. Yeah, I mean, the, the connected flights in Schedule 1 of the bill, um, again, the, the wording of the legislation is slightly different, but the effect of it is the same as the connected flight rules, and it's, it's linked in with the... the uh, the content of section nine of the bill um, with regards to determining where, for the purposes of a tax, where the final destination of a, of a person's journey um, is, is determined to be. Um, and that was considered necessary just to ensure that, um, you know, for example, if uh, under air departure tax, if uh, someone was, say, taking a flight from Edinburgh down to, say, Heathrow and then connecting off to another destination, perhaps a long haul destination, which was not currently offered in a Scottish airport, 
that the, the actual, when measuring actually the, the final destination, um, as long, assuming that the flights were connected, that that would be um, that long haul destination and not, not just uh, Heathrow. So their departure tax that would be charged and that would be on that, on, on that sort of further away point rather than just the, the, the shorter point. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the effect, the effect of it is, is, is the same. Okay, Willie. Okay. Uh, Patrick has a supplementary on the bill. I think is specifics as well. On the on the bill itself and on the uh, pardon me on the the bill itself and on the uh, questions about the provisions allowing ministers to set uh, bands and rates by regulations. Um, the analysis of consultation responses uh, shows a, a very strong degree of concern around the environmental impact uh, of the the changes. Uh, it's barely mentioned, actually, in the policy memorandum, but the, the analysis of responses uh, said that it's by far the most commonly expressed concern. Um, with, can I ask you whether the government gave any active consideration to uh, introducing elements or, or considerations uh, into Section 10 that ministers would have to give uh, consideration to before uh, reaching a view, or before proposing regulations? and whether that was actively ruled out or simply hasn't been considered? Yeah, sorry. So uh, actively considering uh, the, the, the environmental uh, impacts before, it's, before it's coming forward? Fairly, I've, I've seen it in, in many pieces of legislation requiring ministers to give consideration to certain factors before uh, exercising their functions that they have as uh, whether secondary legislation or ministerial orders or what have you. Sure. Was that actively considered? Was that um, ruled out or has it simply not been thought about? I mean, certainly uh, the, uh, the, 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 the environmental um, effects uh, is something that we're, uh, we're very much um, alive to. And as, 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 as part of the, uh, the development and the consideration of, um, of our approach to, um, to rates and bans, that's, uh, that, that, that's something that we are, we are explicitly con con considering. At, at a policy level, and you've told us the strategic environmental assessment is being conducted, although given what was just said a few minutes ago, we're being asked to pass this bill before we get a chance to see that. Um, I'm asking whether there was any consideration given in the development of the bill to introducing uh, criteria that ministers would have to consider into Section 10 before they propose uh, rates and bans? Uh, no. Thank uh, you. That's very clear. Thank you. OK, we've got the financial member and of issues now. James. OK, uh, thanks, convener. Uh, Mr McLellan, in your opening statement, you said that the financial memorandum gave an explanation of the impact on the Scottish budget. Bearing in mind the policy objective of the introduction of ADT is a reduction uh, but on 50 per cent, as, as the policy memorandum describes it, the tax burden um, by the end of the parliamentary session. Um, I don't see any acknowledgement or assessment in the financial memorandum of the fact that that will obviously mean a reduction in the Scottish budget going forward. Can you give an explanation? Yeah, so uh, within within the financial memorandum, we have uh, included OBR forecasts, uh, which are the, uh, the currently available published forecasts of, of what uh, of what would be raised um, through uh, through APD in in, in, in Scotland. Um, so that, that 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 gives you their assessment of, of, of how much would be uh, would, would would be raised if the uh, if, if if the policy was was, was continued. Um, and, and the policy matched that in in, in, in the rest of the UK. Um, I mean, as 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 we've been discussing um, decisions on quite uh, quite what the banding structure would look like, um, how we how we distribute the the fifty percent cut across that, and also the phasing of it um, haven't haven't been uh, haven't been finalised yet. So uh, so it's not it's not it's not possible for us um, at this at this moment in time. Um, to, to, to be able to, uh, uh, to give to give an, uh, an, an estimate um, of, of, of the potential impact um, on the uh, on, on, on the Scottish budget. I mean, certainly that 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 is one of the things that is that is being considered as as, as part of our approach. Um, so um, we're, we're, we're clearly looking at um, uh, the, the, the affordability of this within uh, within the Scottish budget um, uh, alongside uh, looking at. 
you know, wider wider stakeholder views um, and and the available economic evidence um, to su to support that. But you must acknowledge that if paragraph ten of the policy memorandum clearly states that the Scottish government objective is a fifty percent reduction uh, in ADT by the end of the parliamentary session, and table two, as you've um, you've pinpointed in your your answer in terms of the OBR forecast says that revenues would be 378 million if you know we continued in the current vein but that's clearly not the objective of this legislation so it's not it's not true to kind of try and uh, spell out that 378 million would be the the revenue gained uh, in the uh, 21 22 if there was a 50 percent reduction it would it could logically be argued that that would reduce to 189 million uh, bearing in mind there is going to be a reduction that's going to impact on the public finances do you not think the financial memorandum should have given some explanation of that so so that the um the figures that we've set out in the in in the financial memorandum have been derived based on um, what we were able to uh, to put uh, within within the bill. Um, now, you know, the decisions around quite how we distribute the tax and on, on, uh, the, the cut and when it's phased in will determine um, quite what the quite what the revenue uh, impacts would would be. I mean, c certainly in terms of the, the the mechanics of how of how it'll work. Um, so from, from from April 2018, there will be um, a deduction to uh, to the Scottish Block Grant, um, uh, and we've 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 set out um, uh, the approach to how that how that will happen. So it it will be based on effectively um, an, an estimate of, of what the APD tax raised in Scotland in in, in 2017, and then that will be reconciled once once we have outturn. So there there, there will be a, a deduction. Uh, to the Scottish Block Grant in, in 2018, based on that number. Now, uh, depending on what um, uh, where, where, where we get to in terms of um, the policy for uh, uh, for reducing uh, the tax and the phasing uh, through the bill process, that will then determine um, how much revenue is is is, is coming in. Um, now, now there, 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 there may well be a difference between the amount taken off um, uh, and, and, and the amount coming in, depending on where we where, where we get to um, around decisions on on, on the tax uh, rates and bans. But you accept that it is the case that the Scottish budget will reduce following the introduction of this legislation. Um, if if there is uh, um, uh, the uh, if, if 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 we reduce the tax by 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 fifty percent, depending on when 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 it comes in, um, certainly there would be uh, uh, the revenue coming in from that tax would be would be less than um, the amount that's 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 taken off the uh, the block grant. I mean, I think the, the the other thing I should say is that the the, the adjustment to the um, to the block grant will then be indexed to to UK government policy. So. Uh, again, the size of that in future will be dependent on on, uh, on on UK government policy. Which I think I need a bit of clarity right here, James. Yeah. Can, can I just cl clarify that in terms of this specific legislation, it will not decide whether uh, the, it in itself doesn't decide the rates and bans, and therefore um, the the amount of reduction in the Scottish budget won't be decided by this specific legislation, but will be decided by later on by regulation or statutory instrument, depending on what they bring forward in rates and bans. Uh, yeah, that's right. U ultimately, the, uh, the revenue uh, impact will be, will be determined by, uh, by the rates and bans. So. Yeah, but, uh, uh, but the policy objective <laughs> is outlined in paragraph 10 of the policy memorandum is a 50% reduction in what's called the overall tax burden. So, I mean, clearly the government, uh, the government is an objective of reducing these taxes. That's, is that the case? Perhaps I could intervene and, and that my colleague is being purposely uh, strict, strict in his language that he's not moving on from the effect on the revenue coming in from <clears throat> the APD replacement to the total effect that these measures might have on the Scottish budget, because there are all sorts of variables. For example, if a reduction in the, this tax led to increase in economic activity, that could impact on other tax receipts. So we're steering clear of answering that question directly. We're not trying to avoid it. Well, I think 
obviously something the Minister's going to have to be prepared for when he comes in front of us in terms of being able to provide an answer to James Kelly's pretty reasonable question. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll conclude my questions, uh, convener, but I would say that uh, my position is that I think it's a glaring admission from the financial memorandum that there's no <laughs> assessment or acknowledgement of the ongoing impact in the Scottish budget. Patrick, you've got a supplementary on this area. Just, just to follow that up, it, clearly there's a, a question about the direct impact on the Scottish budget from the revenue that would be raised under the policy intention of the Scottish Government as it stands, rather than under the, the, the letter of the bill, but under the, the policy intention. There's also a question about the indirect, the potential indirect consequences for the Scottish budget. And a great deal of the written submissions that we've had uh, from private sector organisations, which clearly have an interest in this policy area, tries to persuade us that there will be an increase in other forms of revenue uh, through economic activity that's generated through the, the government's policy. As far as I can see, the policy, the, the financial memorandum makes no attempt to go into that. Is the government conducting or has it conducted any assessment of what it predicts to be the revenues specifically coming to the Scottish government as opposed to revenues going to the UK government uh, as a result of the, the indirect effects of uh, its policy being put into practice? So we're certainly um, analysing the, um, the, the the potential economic effects um, of of our stated policy objective as as as, as part of the, um, uh, the the decision making, and I think I mean that's uh, that's taking a number of strands. One is around um, considering recent studies which which are currently published. Um, so there, there have been studies from uh, PwC, York Aviation and Edinburgh Airport, who I believe you're, 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 you're taking evidence from later today. Um, so looking at the, the, the existing evidence available, um, we're, we're also looking at uh, international comparisons where that can be helpful. So countries that have taken a similar approach um, to either cutting or, 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 or abolishing the tax, so like Netherlands or, or, or Ireland, to see what, what that can tell us potentially about the, 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 the revenue effects. And then also, we're obviously doing our own internal um, assessment of what, of, 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 of what we think the potential effects would, would be. I appreciate that. And right at the beginning and then again at the end, you said we are conducting or we are assessing. Can I just be clear, that hasn't been completed yet. It's work that's ongoing. Uh, and prior to completing that, we have a policy intention already signalled before we know what the effect is going to be. So, based on existing um, evidence uh, that, that's, that's, that's available, um, we, uh, uh, the, the, the Scottish government set out um, the, the, the policy aims, which is which is covered uh, covered in the uh, in, in the policy memorandum. Um, before 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 taking before taking a final decision on on, on the rates and bans, um, we need to, we, you know. We're, 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 we're continuing to, uh, to, to, to model that. To, so the result to, to of that work and its methodology will be published before a proposal on rates and bans? We, we would certainly be, uh, be, be looking to, uh, to, to, to bring forward that analysis as, um, I, either as part of the uh, strategic environmental um, uh, ass ass assessment or, or to support um, uh, the, um, the, the subordinate uh, legislation around, around rates and bans. Thank you. Now, into wider, James, are you finished all your questions? Yeah. Into wider financial issues, and, and Ivan, please. Thanks, convener, and thanks for coming along. Um, I, t to my mind, the, I think the stated aim of this um, change in terms of the reduction in um, ADT going forward is to generate economic activity, um, and the um, the fifty percent reduction is configured as being. Um, across the board, if you like, so it, it needn't be the same reduction across all classes and and uh, and, uh, and types of travel. Um, and I suppose I just want to drill a wee bit more into that in a bit more detail. Firstly, to find out um, what you've um, the, the the structure of the bill is able to support um, a tackling this in different ways. And I'll give you some examples in a minute to consider. Um, and then secondly, to follow up and see what analysis you may or may not have done around about economic impacts. So, for example, if, if you look at the type of air tra traffic we would want to encourage to generate economic activity, um, inbound uh, tourism, tourism, obviously, is something we want to encourage, whereas outbound tourism, for example, it could have a negative economic effect because you're taking people that make a holiday here and, 
and encouraging them to holiday elsewhere. Um, on the business side of things, there'll be markets that we'd want to target, um, either to bring in foreign uh, businessmen to uh, business people to do work here um, and uh, encourage links from Scotland, direct flights to, to certain markets. And we might decide to prefer some markets over other ones, um, which and you may end up in a situation where there's long haul flights that we want to um, reduce the tax on and shorter flights where we don't want to do that um, for uh, for the purposes I've mentioned. In the domestic versus international sphere, and I think we're going to hear from the Virgin Trains later on, there could be a scenario where we want to um, uh, not encourage domestic flights where there's a um, a, a, an overground, a, a, a train alternative, um, whereas we may want to encourage um, direct flights from Scottish airports to, to, to international destinations. So there's a whole range of scenarios that could or could come to play in a policy scenario where we may want to rather have a very blunt instrument that doesn't give us the, the desired economic benefit. We may want to be very, very focused and targeted on specific types of passionals to specific markets um, and dis uh, discriminating, if that's a word, between inbound versus outbound um, passengers. Now, does the structure of the bill as it stands, allow us that flexibility to do that, or are we simply going to end up with basically what the UK's got, um, which is a very blunt instrument? And secondly, have you done any economic analysis on those different types of a segmentation in the market with respect to different passions and different destinations? Um, I can I can say a bit on that, and then if, 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 if Mike wants to add some detail around, around the actual um, bill, I mean, certainly... Uh, there, there are, as you've, as, as you've rightly said, a, ra a range of, 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 of issues here. Um, and and in, in terms of our, our, our sort of stated economic goals um, around this, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's our belief that we, we, we would, the power over APD uh, will provide us with the, the ability to put new arrangements in, in place which better supports our, our strategic objectives uh, to help generate sustainable growth um, by improving uh, international connectivity um, to Scottish airports, helping to generate new direct routes, uh, sustaining existing ones and importantly increasing inbound inbound tourism. Uh, I mean the sorts of um, uh, analytical issues that you're that you're talking about, so um, inbound tourism versus versus out Bound tourism and, um, and ensuring that our uh, that the structure um, of, of, of the rates and bans uh, minimises effectively leakages from from, from, from the economy for, through through outbound is, is uh, outbound tourism is certainly is certainly something uh, that we're uh, that, that that we're considering and we and we would want to ensure um, that whatever is brought forward maximises uh, the, the opportunities around that. I mean, the other. Debate that you uh, you raised was was was, was long haul versus versus short haul, um, and again, uh, that's 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 something um, that's something we're, uh, we're 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 looking at um, now. There's 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 uh, sort of hot, uh, I suppose the, the strict kind of economic um, impacts of that, but there's also uh, wider impacts in terms of um, uh, rail and, and and how that feeds into it. So uh, I suppose yeah. It, um, the short answer is uh, we're, we're, we're considering um, all all of those um, issues as part of our um, as part of our assessment, our economic assessment, um, uh, and and, uh, and and and, and we, we would be looking to um, design uh, the rates and bans of, 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 of the tax uh, in a way which 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 effectively maximises the, uh, the, the, the 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 benefits based on um, based on the picture that we've that, that, that we've pulled together, which is you know, as as, as, as the question was, does the structure as proposed allow the flexibility to cope with all of those different variations? Yeah, so so it will it it, it, it will do. I mean on, on, on the specifics of the bill, I don't know if Mike wants to say anything additional. Yeah, I, I think the, the fundamental parts of the of the leg the ultimate legislation, both primary and secondary, if that's the case, that, that you're kind of talking about those particular areas. I think those are bits of detail still to be uh, set out because I, I would view those I think probably um, most focused on the tax bans and the tax rate amounts. Um, in terms of the structure of the bill that's introduced at the moment, um, the, like I say, the core concept of the tax is, is um, we we'll have to pay due regard with the scope of the powers that have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Um, we've got uh, tax rates set out there, so um, that's the only part of the, the sort of the core, core structure of the tax in terms of the inter interrelations between the tax rate amounts um, that's actually in the bill. Um, so. Uh, in terms of the, you know, the 
the biggest opportunities for delivering those and considering those types of um, areas, that, that, that's in legislation still to be uh, put forward. So, so I would allow that, I would allow because you might end up with 10 or 20 bands, depending on where you want to target. You might have different rates for different types of pastures. You might have a different rate depending on whether they start somewhere, come here and go home again, or vice versa. You might have a different rate depending on how long they spend here. Is there flexibility to do all of that within the structure you've got? I mean, the, 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 those types of latter issues in terms of how much people spend and things like that, that you would, you would have to pay with reg uh, due regard to, obviously, the legal constraints, but also um, trying to keep the tax simple as well. I mean, the, one of the guiding principles of the, sort of the devolved taxes is, is keeping to the Adam Smith principles. And uh, w one of the, um, one of the, you know, the, the generally acknowledged features of the UK taxes is, it, is its simplicity. And it's one of the um, most cost effective taxes in terms of the collection and management of it as well. Um, we'd have to pay re regard to the impact of any policies um, that were reflected in the structure of the tax to you know, go to those types of areas, um, consider the impact that it would have on, say, airlines and just uh, overall how the aviation sector and the tourism sector works. Um, sure. I mean, airlines have got very complicated software that does all this stuff anyway, so it's, um, it's, it's an industry that isn't unused to very complicated charging structures. Um, so I suppose the final part is I look forward to, bring, to you bringing forward analysis on that and really following up on what, what Patrick was asking earlier. Um, that's something you, you, you will bring forward analysis on looking at the segmentation of the different market aspects of this in due course, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, so economic impact. It's, it, it is it is one of the one of the many factors that we're including uh, as as part of our our, our economic analysis, um, and uh, and yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll look uh, to bring further details on that in due course. Neil Bibby. Yeah, on, on the <coughs> economic impact policy uh, in the policy amendment and in paragraph seven, it says strategic objective. Scottish government believes that the tax to be an increasing burden on airports, airlines, and passengers, which holds back air route. Uh, development, um, and that was published at the end of last year. But at the start of this year, we've we've seen figures. Um, Glasgow Airport recorded a record 9.4 million passengers in 2016. Edinburgh Airport recorded 12.4 million um, passengers in 2016. That's up 11% uh, on 2015. So my, I appreciate there's a debate to be had about about the rate in which the the taxes um, post tax will be set at. But I wanted to ask why. Why does the Scottish Government believe it's necessary to change the rate of tax if passenger numbers um, are already increasing? What other factors and policies have been considered to support aviation uh, growth? And for example, has the Scottish Government done it, an analysis of a concern about increasing tourism? Um, what, has the Scottish Government done an analysis on the effect, for example, of a fallen rate in the pound in attracting investment? And does it not? Um, consider that there may actually be an increase in passenger numbers and tourism without changing the rates of APD? Yeah, so um, I think the first thing to say is that the, the, the trend for air passenger numbers globally is, is, is upwards. Um, so it's not, it's not just a fact reflecting in the, in, in the Glasgow and, and, and Edinburgh airport numbers, and that's reflecting the return to, uh, to economic growth um, and the, uh, the increase in available airline capacity. Um, I mean, in, in terms of the current APD rates, um, they are, uh, it is one of the highest taxes of its kind in, in, in the world. I think if, 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 if you look across uh, the overall a aviation tax, the UK is, is, is second only behind Chad. So, um, uh, so that's, you, you know, I, I suppose that uh, the competitiveness of, 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 of the tax rate is something, is something that we're, that, that, uh, that we're uh, looking at and concerned about. I mean, certainly cutting the tax burden um, helps to ensure, we believe, a more level playing field uh, with many of the other European airports, often competing to secure the same airlines and, 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 and routes. Um, uh, and, and, and through doing that, that then enables us um, uh, to, uh, to to de develop those 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 new routes um, and, and, and sustaining uh, the, uh, the, the the existing routes. Um, my other question was um, based on it was touched on there the, the principles around taxation and and, and the, one of the principles the Adam Smith principles of proportionality and the, and the ability to pay. Um, has the Scottish government, following on from from Ivan McKee's question about about um, 
the impact on individual groups. Has the Scottish Government done an analysis on the demographics of pa airline passengers in Scotland? And you know, do airline passengers tend to be the poorest in society or the, the most well-off in society? And what, what impact will that have on those particular um, those particular groups? So the, the impact on specific groups, uh, again, is something that we'll be factoring into um, uh, into our analysis, um, and it's, it's 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 a range of things that will be that, that that we'll be considering. I mean, ultimately, the effect um, will 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 depend on the um, uh, on 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 the decision around around rates and bans. Thanks, Neil. Thank you very much, um, Marie. Thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to ask firstly around the issue of climate change impact and I see that the um, Committee on Climate Change advised that any increase in emissions from um, reducing AGT is likely to be manageable. Their uh, assessment is that it will be about a 4% increase in emissions and that that would be able to be offset by other um, changes that we might make in, in the transport sector. Would you broadly agree with that and with that conclusion as well? Um, and yeah, uh, and yeah. would the people submitting, you know, putting forward opinions in your consultation also be in agreement? Yeah, I, so I mean, I think f firstly we certainly recognise that that there will be environmental impacts from uh, from, from 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 the policy, um, and, and and you're right to say that the committee on on, on climate change has has advised that uh, the increase in emissions should be should be manageable. I mean. What, what we've said is that we're um, we're, we're going to work um, uh, harder in, in, in other areas in order to uh, to mitigate um, the, the effects of that uh, essentially, um, and we've we've mentioned before uh, that the the environmental impacts um, are being carefully considered through the uh, strategic environmental assessment process. Is, is there debate at all around those numbers? Because four percent doesn't seem like a huge um, difference to me. Um, not cer certainly not that I'm I'm, I'm aware of. Oh, okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about is I'm a representative for the Highlands and Islands, so I'm particularly interested in hearing about um, what people had to say about the um, exemptions for uh, at the moment the Highlands and Islands airports are all exempt from uh, the taxation. Is that likely to be continued in future? I mean, yeah. So, in 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 terms of the the consultation uh, responses, as we touched on um, before, there was certainly uh, overwhelming <laughs> um, support uh, to keep uh, the tax structure similar, but also to uh, to keep um, uh, similar similar exemptions. Um, I mean, we can't, um, as 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 we touched on in response to uh, some of the earlier questions, uh, we can't at this stage say say anything more. Um, on, on, on specific exemptions, but um, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've committed to, uh, to coming forward with further details on that shortly. And can I just pick up on the timescales of the further details? You said something about this bill going through in, in September and that the detail would be available subsequent to that. Is that correct? Yeah, so the, 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 the hope is that we, uh, that we get the bill passed uh, before, um, uh, before summer recess. Um, so that's, that's certainly our, what, what we're planning to do. Um, and then uh, issues to be brought forward through subordinate legislation would be, would be after that. Um, so in, in, in the autumn, September, October. So, so just to clarify, it is likely that tickets will be sold and then subsequently taxes will need to be charged for already made sales if the on sale about 340 days before, is that correct? Um, on those on those specific uh, tickets, yeah, that that, that 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 would be correct. I mean, I think the, the, the other thing to add is through um, so through through the other routes uh, that we that, that we have. So we mentioned the stakeholder forum, uh, which draws on uh, a range a range of stakeholders. So 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 industry and in, in, uh, is 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 one of those. Um, and, and and through that forum, we're uh, we're trying to give uh, the airlines as much uh, advanced certainty. Um, ahead of uh, final decisions being made on, 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 on rates and bans as we can. Thank you. Yep, uh, I've got a quick follow-up on that, sp on that specific issue in yeah, terms so of... In the, just to back. make sure I've understood that answer to Mary Todd correctly, what, what you're talking about retrospective taxation by a secondary instrument. What, what um, legal advice has the government sought or taken to ensure that um, proceeding in that manner would be would not be vulnerable to judicial review in the court of session? Uh, 
apologies if any confusion was um, uh, was, was 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 caused with the, uh, with my initial answer there. I mean, um, we're not talking about or. What I was, uh, what I wasn't talking about in my answer was, was retrospective um, uh, changes to, uh, to, to to taxation. Um, I, I, I was I was picking up on the specific point about uh, about the timing of, of, of when the details um, uh, of, of, of tax uh, rates, bans, and exemptions would, um, uh, would, would, would 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 come in. And this was, yeah, sorry. If, if you're talking, perhaps I've misunderstood. In which case, I apologise. But but if you're talking about um, applying a tax in the autumn to a ticket sale that has preceded the point of tax liability, that's retrospective taxation, isn't it? Yeah, so the, ta the tax will come in from, uh, from the 1st of April 2018. Um, uh, and, 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 and from that point, we'll have uh, full details of, uh, of, of the tax rates and bans. So the, when you say the tax will come in on the 1st of April or in April uh, 2018, do you mean that this bill will take effect or that the um, se secondary instruments uh, that establish what the bans and rates are will take effect in... I mean, I'm not quite sure if I understand exactly the chronology of this. Yeah, ev ev everything. That's that's that that's that's the that's our, uh, our is 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 our, is our ambition right. to have to have the bill the, the bill passed um, by uh, uh, by summer recess um, and then uh, any additional points which which weren't covered um, around things like exemptions, rates, and bans through uh, through secondary legislation it, well in advance of um, of the, the the tax coming in from April 2018. Thank you, Patrick. Very much. Uh, I wanted to follow up the questions on climate change because I didn't think they needed to be quite that softball. The UK <laughs> Committee on Climate Change um, has, which of course has a, a formal role in advising the Scottish Government uh, on, on climate change under the Climate Change Scotland Act, uh, has clearly recommended that aviation emissions by 2050 need to be limited to 2005 levels. That does allow some degree of demand increase, but not unlimited demand increase. Um, the UK government nominally uh, accepts that advice. Whether we think its actions are consistent with achieving that outcome is, is another matter. Does the Scottish government, in how it's framing this uh, aviation tax, take a similar view uh, that aviation emissions need to be limited to 2005 levels by 2050? Or does it have no policy on that? Um, I think on the, uh, on, on, on the specifics uh, of, uh, of, of, of our commitment to, um, to, to overall uh, aviation emissions and how that feeds into uh, our, our, our climate change plan, um, we'll, need, we'll, need to, we'll need to write to you on that uh, if, you, if you want further details. So there is no policy context on what you expect aviation emissions to be going forward, which has informed the development of this bill? Um, or so of there, its policy there, So there, 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 uh, there has been in terms of the, uh, the, 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 overall, the overall effects. Um, so, well, so, so, so this was set out in, the, um, uh, in, in, in our approach to the uh, strategic environmental Assessment, um, and there will be an update to that as part of the uh, the twelve week consultation that we'll that, that we'll do. So, 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 so in that we will we, we will set out uh, our our assessment of what we think the effects uh, will, will 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 be around that. As we discussed earlier, is still ongoing. So, just to be clear, in framing this legislation and its policy intentions uh, in relation to this replacement tax, the Scottish government has no view yet formed. Uh, on whether it will comply with the UK Committee on Climate Change's recommendation that aviation emissions by 2050 should not exceed 2005 levels, is that correct? Um, I mean, again, un until until the, uh, uh, the the the, um, the full the full analysis is done of the uh, of, of, of the effects of it, um, I, I, uh, we can't we can't comment. Um, I mean, I suppose on 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 on, on the specifics of the of, of, of the target, the minister. But I, I think even an official is able to comment on whether the government has a view on that question. Yeah, on, on, on the specifics of the of, of, of the target, um, uh, I mean, we'd be we'd be happy to uh, uh, to write to write on that on that issue. But um, I think on, on, on the basis of the uh, of, 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 of the assessment of the environmental impacts that we've done to date, um, uh, and those and those 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 have been published. 
um, uh, how how that inter uh, interacts with the um, uh, with 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 the wider UK target. I'm I'm, I'm afraid I, uh, I I don't know the details of that, but I, but we'd be happy to write. Right. And additionally, when you're writing, can you tell us when you're bringing forward the considering the rates, etc. Later, can you make sure you tell us how you're going to go through that same exercise on, on, on the rates and when you bring forward the secondary legislation, what the process will be. Because it's not just about the primary legislation, it's also about the secondary legislation that will follow. Um, because obviously, you know, anybody, and it, it would be up to members around the, the table to propose different rates. They could, put, they could suggest rates that go up and that, that, will have, that would have an, um, an environmental impact or they could su suggest they stay the same and they would, that would have an environmental impact. This is the principle of bringing in a piece of legislation, but I think Patrick's questions are fair enough. Um, I think that just leaves Liam to deal with IT matters. Yes, uh, just a couple of wrap-up questions very quickly. Um, just first of all to follow up on something that Neil Bibby asked about. I understand uh, from your answer that there hasn't been any particular analysis done of the socio-economic profile of people flying. Uh, going beyond that, then, can we extrapolate to say that there hasn't been any analysis done on uh, who is flying where to and why in terms of, for example, business travel uh, and what can be expensed in terms of passenger duty? Is that correct? There's, there isn't that analysis yet. Uh, that 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 is a core part of the analysis that we're that we're undertaking um, uh, to, to to pick up this 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 inbound outbound um, dynamic, but also um, of the of, of 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 the categories um, of, of of people taking flights. So uh, whether it's leisure, or business, um, that um, that we're 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 looking we're looking at that. Right. Uh, just on the IT issue raised, uh, a note in the financial memorandum. Uh, that there's an estimate of £120,000 to set up the IT uh, to make this work. Now, given the costs and difficulties experienced in setting up various other IT projects uh, and the current costs associated with those, uh, how accurate is the £120,000 estimate? Uh, because it feels rather low. So the, uh, the costs provided in the financial memorandum uh, represent Revenue Scotland's, uh, I think it is the, um, the Revenue Scotland IT cost um, point that you're, uh, that you're referring to. Um, so it's effectively their, their, their best estimate um, of, of, of the resources uh, that will be needed to deliver ADT. I, I, I should say that um, it's, um, it's, it's the development of a new ADT module um, on, on the existing uh, Revenue Scotland tax collection system. Um, so it's not something completely completely new. Um, and, and in terms of the costs in, in, in general, so uh, they, they, they were based on on, on a robust um, business case, which was uh, compliant with with Treasury Green Book methodology, uh, and it was also approved by the Revenue Scotland board. So um, so there was a, a, a thorough process of, um, uh, of, of of scrutiny of those of those costs. Just a final quick thought. The We've received various representations, and uh, indeed Avin McKee uh, suggested that the, the way to stimulate economic activity, the way to stimulate growth, the way to stimulate uh, uh, the economy, uh, in this instance, is by reducing tax. Uh, and presumably the converse is true, that if we increase tax, potentially that stifles the economy uh, and growth and jobs. Uh, so I just wondered, do you accept that analysis and how will that ultimately inform thinking about bans and uh, policy? Yeah, so I, I mean, our, 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 our broad position on this um, is that um, you know, APD is, is, is one of the, uh, the highest taxes of its kind in, 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 in the world. Um, and so as, as, as we've set out before, uh, we, we believe Cutting that tax will give um, Scotland a, a competitive advantage um, against against other uh, other other airports who are who are who are trying to attract the same uh, the same new new new, new routes. So um, uh, so so that's 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 I suppose the, uh, the, the the overall rationale sitting behind it. Right. Okay. 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 Th thank you much. I thank witnesses for coming along this morning. I now suspend the meeting to allow a change over of witnesses.
Um, colleagues, our next piece of business is to continue our consideration of the air departure tax bill at stage one. Uh, we are joined for the second panel of our witnesses by um, Tim Aldersleek, who is the Chief Executive of UK Airlines UK, Jonathan Hinklis, who is the Managing Director of Logan Air Limited, Gordon Dewar, who is the Chief Executive of Edinburgh Airport, and David Horn, the Managing Director of East Coast Route Virgin T um, Trains. Now, members have received copies of written submissions from each of our witnesses, so I think we'll just go straight to questions. I could have asked you all to make an opening statement. We might not get finished the business today. Um, but uh, obviously, you'll be aware that the bill does not specify the proposed rate of taxation to replace the existing UK air passenger duty, which should be considered by the Parliament further down the line. However, some of you have experience of the administrative arrangements governing the current system. Are there any ways in which you would suggest the new devolved Scottish system could improve on the current one in terms of administrative arrangements? And what changes would you like to see, and why? Feel free, whoever wants to kick that off. Um, so, LNG Pay were quite clear that we wanted... Uh, the new arrangement to be as uh, similar as possible to the uh, UK government arrangements for our members. That was absolutely uh, uh, vital uh, for them. So we were quite pleased when the Scottish government put out their, uh, their consultation documents stipulating that um, the arrangements, the bans, uh, the capital cities, uh, the exemptions would be as similar as possible to, to the UK. So. We are uh, very, very pleased with that. Um, from our perspective, um, as simple as possible and as close as possible to the UK is what our members want. Okay. Good. Uh, I mean, this is really much more of an issue for the airlines in terms of the administration of this, as you know. I mean, what it's very obvious is one of the most efficient tax collection methods. I think it's the most efficient. I think there's two people in entirety manage that for the whole of the UK at the moment. So there's huge benefits of that simplicity, as well for the consumer, where it's very clear to the consumer what that tax is and what they're paying for. Um, I think there is an argument that says, while we want to keep the bans and the administrations of one another, there is potentially some argument for variation in levels, and clearly that's the secondary legislation than the policy that um, we're probably more interested in terms of its impact on the economic benefits. Jonathan? We would similarly say that uh, keeping the uh, uh, tax collection structure as close to that of the uh, rest of the UK in terms of being able to have the back-of-house administration that goes into collecting the tax would be helpful. Um, we clearly have views on, uh, on levels uh, of, of APD, which perhaps we'll, we'll come on to. Um, but in terms of the actual structure uh, and collection of it, yes, the administrative burden is a, a big factor in an airline's uh, life. Making that happen uh, and uh, retaining that along the lines of something that we already have uh, would be our view. And do you think the, le the collection process as outlined in the bill is robust? Is it satisfactory or would you like to see any changes in it? Um, we don't have any fundamental issue with what's been proposed in the bill. We're content with the uh, 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 suggestions that have been made and all that that we've heard at, uh, in uh, meetings with the uh, Scottish Government, which have been held with airlines to consult around this in the preparation of the bill. Yeah, likewise as well, the, um, uh, the quarterly online collection um, is, uh, is, is uh, uh, more than uh, adequate for our, for our members. Um, so no problem with that at all. Uh, currently we've got monthly... Uh, paper, so actually it's an improvement. Um, so we're very happy with that. David, I'm not sure from a train's perspective whether you've got any view on that at this stage. Not on the administrative issues that the airlines face, no. OK, well, one of the key concepts underlying the proposed tax is in relation to chargeable passengers and chargeable aircraft follow the structure of the APD, as we know. Um, what are you, what's your view of the definitions used, and are there any changes in the definitions that you'd wish to have seen in the bill? in order to improve the operation of the tax, and that's probably Tim and Jonathan in particular. Uh, again, in terms of the chargeable passengers, chargeable uh, aircraft, uh, we're very happy uh, to have the same arrangements as uh, what we've currently got uh, with the UK, so we don't want any changes to that um, at all. So very happy with what we've seen. Okay. I think in terms of the chargeable aircraft, it protects the exemption for small aircraft of below 5.7 tonnes takeoff weight, which operate many of the lifeline air services. That is fundamental uh, to us. Uh, and we believe also that uh, the, the other element is more around the existing exemptions uh, being retained for uh, connected passengers 
uh, and for passengers who are travelling on routes that are operated under a public service obligation, uh, uh, primarily with either the Scottish Government uh, or with local councils, depending on the uh, administering body for the PSOs. So um, broadly, we're, we're comfortable, but we think it is essential that those uh, existing exemptions are maintained uh, within the definitions of chargeable passenger and chargeable aircraft. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and get in some of the members who didn't get a chance to ask questions as early as I possibly can, but to enable that to happen, I need to get a, a more general question. And first, so Ivan, I'm going to come to you to talk about the, 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 yeah, the general yeah. issues. To go back and reflect on the, um, or, or ask your, your, your comments on the, um, the points I was making earlier, the, um, the main point of the, the, the tax reduction going forward would be to generate economic activity, but clearly there's a, there's a differentiation there because some types of travel that you encourage will actually reduce economic activity in Scotland and the range of other economic activity you might uh, encourage, there's, there's quite a range there in terms of the, the positive impact it might have. And I saw in the Edinburgh Airport analysis, I think you did two different scenarios based on the type of passengers that may be encouraged to travel. But that was a very passive approach to it. You were saying this may happen or that might happen. Um, I suppose I'm coming at it from the angle of what do we want to happen and how do we make it happen. So notwithstanding the facts you've already commented on, you, you want to keep the thing as simple as possible. Do you have any analysis or um, any comments to make on the type of travel we might want to encourage for the good of the whole economy and not just to get more people buying their duty free, but for the good of the whole economy? And any, any comments on that? So, um, I, I mean, I think there's, there's two fundamental impacts of a reduction, whatever the form that reduction takes. It's one, it um, reduces the price for travel in some shape or form and therefore makes it more accessible to people. So that's actually more impactful on lower income people, I suspect, in terms of that being a meaningful change. Um, the other thing that is really the, the bigger driver of the wider economy is the encouragement of further connectivity. And that's obviously new routes, new airlines coming in. Now, it's clear that different routes will have different impacts. Um, I think it's fair to say that long-haul routes are seen as very attractive propositions, particularly those that are bringing inbound visitors. But equally, the whole of Europe is very, very fertile ground for inbound um, tourism in Scotland. And in terms of volume and impact, um, that would actually be a bigger impact, even though the rate of growth may be larger on long haul if there was a significant reduction. Uh, and the advantages of that are that even though offering more choice to Scottish residents will undoubtedly allow them to go to different places, in itself, it probably doesn't generate a huge amount of more outbound trips. Uh, people are largely constrained by their affordability and their time constraints in it rather than um, the choice. They may just go somewhere different. Whereas if we make Scotland accessible and affordable to get to and direct services are the best way of doing that, what we see every time is a very, very large increase in the number of inbound visitors. And in fact, every single um, long haul route in particular and most of the short haul international routes that have arrived at Edinburgh over the last four years have seen a majority of inbound passengers over outbound. Is there international comparisons then? I mean, if you look at, for example, Copenhagen or Oslo, which have got 20 odd million passengers just going through their main airports alone, never mind all their other airports they've got. Um, so clearly they're a, a, a step above where Scotland is in terms of the amount of travel they've got going through for, for similar sized countries. Do you see in that scenario there's significantly more um, outbound, outbound type travel coming through? Outbound from Scotland? No, no, from into those countries. I don't know if you've done any analysis on that. Because yeah. clearly that's where we want to get to. We want to get to the level where, where you've got 20 odd million going through Edinburgh, same as Copenhagen. Well, you've, you've, yeah, I mean, I absolutely aspire yeah. to 20 million. They do it in a certain way. They have a home based hub operator. So a lot of the, the passengers you see at Copenhagen, as you would in Heathrow, are actually through passengers and making very little difference to the local economy. So that's not necessarily a great comparator. But what we see is that if we have a significant reduction of having, and uh, we were going to see a very significant interest. Um, in airlines bringing new routes. Uh, we already have on record Callum McCall of EasyJet saying that she'd increase uh, passengers in Scotland by 30% at the back of this. Michael O'Leary has been very robust about his uh, intentions to increase if he sees it. And if we do it quickly and if we do it very clearly, we'll probably get an over-response because they want to demonstrate the impact. And I say an over-response because we shouldn't forget that even if we halved it across the board, would still be the most expensive air passenger duty anywhere in the world other than Chad. So, you know, all we're doing is reducing our discrepancy and our disadvantage, we're not getting ahead of the curve in any shape or form. 
It's also, I mean, on, on that context as well, there was a, a, a question earlier about, you know, are, should we be worried about, um, you know, there's already success. Should remind the members that um, we only got back to the 2008 passenger numbers last year. Uh, so while Edinburgh, we're in a lucky position that we've got a very strong economy and growing well and doing well out of that, you wouldn't see the same about Aberdeen and Prestwick and many other airports at the moment. I think, I think it's important to say that uh, last year we had uh, 251 million passengers across the, the UK as a whole. Um, and absolutely, it's, it's, it's great that Edinburgh and, uh, and Glasgow airports are doing well. Um, but, you know, that's not unique across the whole of the UK, uh, with the exception of uh, probably one or two uh, airports, uh, you know, Liverpool and Dome Tees, for example, most airports in, in, in the UK uh, as a whole are uh, experiencing very, very strong passenger numbers. But uh, as Gordon says, that is only getting back to where we were in 2008 before the economic uh, crisis. Um, and I think it's also important to say that Edinburgh and, and Glasgow um, and Aberdeen, there is still significant growth of existing runway infrastructure um, that we can utilise. So. Um, I would, I would rebut the, the point that you were making uh, earlier that somehow just because we're, uh, we're doing well uh, in Scotland and across the UK that somehow there needs to be a cap on, on passenger numbers. Um, that absolutely is not, is not the case. When you've got existing infrastructure and you've got spare capacity, we should be doing everything that we can to get more routes in and more connectivity. Jonathan, do you want to respond to some of that as well? In terms of the economic activity, we believe that uh, there's a, a strong opportunity here to actually make a real difference in the Highlands and Islands, um, and this is around the current exemption that exists for flights from the Highlands and Islands, reciprocating that so that passengers departing from Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen to the Highlands and Islands actually are lifted out of uh, uh, APD as it is today and ADT as it will be in future. Um, we believe that that will actually give the fastest return on investment in terms of the Scottish Government's uh, uh, funding of that, which will be well below £2 million a year in absolute cash terms uh, of the uh, tax currently collected from those customers. The reasons we say that, around a quarter of passengers travelling on those routes today are funded directly by uh, public uh, services such as NHS patients travelling, councils, all of those areas. So around a quarter of the tax income currently coming from customers flying uh, from uh, the mainland airports out to the Highlands and Islands is already funded by government and therefore on the basis of not wishing to per perpetuate a money merry-go-round it would make sense to do that. But also then in terms of growing the traffic uh, travelling into Highlands and Islands airports um, that that will also allow us to uh, generate more income on, for Hyle through the charges it levies to airlines like Logan Air um, that uh, will have reduced the subsidy that that has to take from government. So there's a fairly direct case before you get into what we think are some strong economic impacts about encouraging tourism uh, and uh, um, encouraging business through the Highlands and Islands to do that. And these are routes we carry around half a million passengers a year on routes exclusively within Scotland, and all bar one of those routes crosses a body of water. Um, so trains are not uh, a substitute uh, in, the, uh, in the market in which we serve, and also from an environmental perspective, the sum of a car plus a ferry journey uh, to travel, for example, between Glasgow and Stornoway uh, is uh, generating, depending on the way you do it and the number of passengers travelling, more emissions than an air journey directly from Glasgow to Stornoway. Okay. So we believe that there is a strong case economically, a strong case environmentally, um, and uh, a strong case uh, really for the uh, uh, indirect economic benefits through the Highlands and Islands uh, of reciprocating that exemption that's there today. And one of the early things that we would like to see happen under the uh, Scottish Government's powers to uh, uh, levy the air departure tax uh, is that uh, those routes from Glasgow and Edinburgh Aberdeen today uh, are lifted out of ADT for flights departing to the Highlands and Islands. Okay, I know that Marie's going to want to ask you some questions specifically on rural areas, and don't worry, David, we're going to get to trains as well. Um, but I've got a couple of supplementaries. Ash Denham first. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm actually an Edinburgh MSP, so obviously we know Edinburgh Airport is um, Scotland's busiest airport, and it's also a really big employer in the area as well. So um, this is obviously particularly for um, Mr Dewar. So I think you've done a number, there have been a number of studies, Edinburgh Airport have done a study themselves on um, what you see as the economic impact of, of reducing this tax. And I'm wondering if you could share with us some of the findings that you've had there, but particularly around maybe the wider economic impact for Edinburgh and maybe the surrounding area, but also in terms of the monetary value, maybe in terms of the GVA. 
Yeah, so the, um, the sort of value we think in terms of across Scotland of the reduction, and we modelled this on just a halving of all because um, that was just based on the statement that we want to reduce the tax take and it would, it would vary if there was different bands and rates. But effectively we think it's 10,000 extra jobs um, across Scotland, largely in the tourism industry, some of them directly involved in aviation with new routes and new airlines, for example, and about 300 million gross GVA added across of that. Um, I think what's even more interesting, though, is that the revenue take is positive as well very quickly. There may be a modest lag as things take time to bed in and we get the growth that we're seeing. But if we have a very clear statement of policy, the airlines are actually very quick at responding and the benefits we get from additional passengers, albeit playing lower APD, is it bridges some of that gap. We get all sorts of other revenue income streams with new um, uh, taxes from employment, for example, and one of the biggest wins are the reduction in unemployment benefits being paid as people get back into uh, employment, obviously, are independently um, living their lives as a result of that. Um, and that's before we get into all the indirect economic values of uh, the, the wider um, the spend of tourists, for example, in the Highlands and Islands. So across the piece, it's, it's, it's one of the best investments you're likely to see, where not only do you get economic return, but you actually get a cash return in through the government's coffers. So obviously we, you, you heard some of the session this morning and we were talking about, um, somebody mentioned that it, for this attacks of this type it was it's one of the most expensive in Europe and possibly wider than that. So the direction that the Scottish Government is looking at going at, um, how do you think that fits into the, the wider um, context, like what are other countries doing on this tax at the moment or recently? All, with the exception of Norway, um, which has only just recently announced an increase in this tax, and I think they're about to find out the folly of that, every other country has gone in the opposite direction, so and mostly have abolished. So the only benchmark, which is an interesting one, I've never compared Scotland with Chad before, but it's the only country that we've actually on a par with. Every other country in Europe is either down at the sort of two or three euros or free. So we're a complete outstand, outlier in that regard, which is kind of counterintuitive given that we are at the very northwest periphery on an island and we're incredibly dependent upon inbound tourism where tourism is the largest employer in the country. So that to me seems to be completely perverse logic um, and you know, so effectively we can reverse or at least address some of that by having it and remember we'll still be significantly more expensive than just about every other country. In fact, we'll still be the most expensive uh, than any other country in Europe even if we have to across the board. Then that would seem to be a pretty logical um, policy to pursue. Yeah, we, we did a report on this uh, last year, um, and if Scotland uh, pushes ahead with a 50% uh, reduction, then Scotland would improve for sure haul. Um, it's standing by 38 places over the rest of uh, the UK. Um, for long haul, it would rank uh, the ninth highest in the world, uh, leaving England and Wales at the top of uh, the league table. Um, so even, it, you know, it would still be one of the most uncompetitive nations in the world, uh, both for short haul and for um, and for long haul, um, but it would be getting somewhere um, up, up, up the league tables. Um, and um, you know, I would hasten to add that I don't think Chad is uh, the kind of place that we should be uh, comparing ourselves with when it comes to uh, air ticket taxes and uh, charges. Um, so I think um, I think that's quite quite a useful analysis there in terms of where Scotland would would sit compared to where it sits currently. Just one more question, Camina, just to bring in the train aspect of this. So obviously, Edinburgh Airport. Um, you know, a lot of business travellers fly from Edinburgh to London and obviously, you know, the, the train network are con um, concerned about the impact that it, that it may have. So, so do you see that as being um, a factor for you? Yeah, so I think in our statement we have said that there are clear benefits from reducing APD in terms of generating better international connectivity. Clearly, we all want to uh, improve trade. We want to attract more tourists to Scotland and the, the economic benefits that that will bring. Um, but on domestic routes, our analysis is that reducing APD will simply result in a switch between modes from air or from rail to air in this case, if APD is reduced on the domestic routes as is currently uh, being discussed. So that's absolutely something that we're concerned about. Rail has a great success story over the past few years with more services coming to Scotland, investment in improving services, and there is further investment uh, either underway or being developed that will absolutely benefit Scotland's connectivity and Edinburgh's connectivity. And uh, our, our view is we need to uh, absolutely protect that because that is as important as the international connectivity that Scotland's seeking as well.
Okay, thank you. I'm going to get in deeper into real issues, so we'll come back and let other responses. I know Murdo Fraser's got a question on that, but I want to follow through on other supplementaries in the area we were in earlier. So, Neil. Yeah, um, just for the record, I didn't say there should be a cap on, on passenger numbers. I was asking the very legitimate and reasonable question, which is why is it necessary to cut APD when passenger numbers um, are increasing? And obviously, I hear what has been said about um, getting up to the levels of 2008, but obviously we had a global financial crash in 2008, and obviously there's wider economic reasons for that. But can I just ask generally, why, why have passenger numbers been increasing at Edinburgh and Glasgow um, over over the past couple of years, and do you expect, irrespective of what happens with APD, for example, over the next year, do you expect passenger numbers to increase again over the coming year without a cut in APD? So I, I think you've got to come at this from the wider market view. So the, the wider European market, aviation market, is growing about 5% per annum at the moment. So if you're at 5% per annum, you're on marketplace. And that's a result of a fairly benign um, position where the UK economy is being doing reasonably well overall. Uh, certainly comparatively speaking, oil prices are low, so fuel prices for airlines are reasonable and manageable. Um, so we're in, we're in one of the upswings in terms of the general economic. So you should only really be taking any comfort from above 5% growth because otherwise you're just marking time with the rest of the, the wider economies. So I would argue that one of the reasons you're seeing um, uh, getting back to 2008 levels is a market correction. Um, there's uh, effectively, you're seeing quite a significant move from Presswick to Glasgow, for example. So that's not market growth overall, that's just market transfer. And Edinburgh has done well because actually our economy has done exceedingly well in comparison to the rest of the UK. So, and I'd also like to think we've done something right in terms of the way we engage with airlines and point out the benefits they can have. So we're out there competing with hundreds of other airports around the world, trying to make the case why airlines should make very, very risky and large investments into Edinburgh and Scotland rather than somewhere else. And I think we've got good at that and we've come off of a position where we were shared ownership with Glasgow and, if you like, the gloves are off and we're prepared to fight our corner to get our fair market share within Scotland. So all of that's true, but I don't, I don't want to over-encourage the idea that we're doing marvellously and it'll all continue. That's not the case. The economy is driving most of it. There's some modest upside in terms of some of the things we're doing, but we're going to have to work really hard. And my competition isn't with Presswick or Glasgow or Aberdeen. I am competing every day with EasyJet and Ryanair uh, against Copenhagen, against Barcelona, against Rome and against all of our other European competitors. That's the market we should be looking at and we are massively under... Um, uh, I guess against the wind because physically we're further away so you have to burn more fuel and more staff time to get here and our tax is the highest in Europe by a long way. Can I just, obviously you recorded an 11% increase in 2016, can I just press you again, do you, do you expect passenger numbers to increase over the next year, 2017? Yeah, we'll, we'll grow in 2017, we don't expect to grow by that much. The the reality is we'll, we'll the, the aviation market is highly leveraged against general economic growth and then you'll get some local conditions. So if the, if the economy is growing at 2%, aviation will grow at 4 or 5%. If, but the converse is true. Most airports were seeing double-digit declines 2008 over to 2010. So it's not like it just lands on a lap. We have to work really hard at this. And of course, what happens in a constraining or flat market is that airlines work even harder to find the margin somewhere else. And if I put this in context, if we took a £13 APD departure tax um, that is levied. My average charge to an airline per passenger is under £10. So I'm out there competing, offering discounts to airlines to entice them away from Copenhagen, and I can't even get close to matching um, what APD is before I even start. So even if I go free, we're still more expensive as a result of that tax as most other European airports. I think it's worth putting on the record as well that, um, according to IATA, the average uh, profit per passenger for airlines is seven seven dollars um, and when you've got a UK rate of APD at 13 pounds uh, that puts it into into context um, so our our members have spent um, upwards of about 50 billion dollars over the last 10 years buying 470 new aircraft we've got 400 more on order um, some of those are replacing uh, existing aircraft, but some are new uh, new aircraft that uh, airlines are trying to get into uh, into new destinations to set up new routes and greater connectivity. Um, so they, they will go where they can get uh, the biggest bang for, for their buck. Um, and uh, EasyJet, they are a, a UK carrier, but they've got bases all over Europe. Um, and so when you're only making a, a fraction 
you know, several several pounds, several dollars uh, per passenger, uh, you will go, uh, if you have to, you'll go in, into Europe, uh, to Copenhagen, elsewhere in Europe, where you'll make a, a bigger profit. Um, Patrick, I think you've got issues on the, the economy issues on this as well. Yes, thank you, Camino. Good morning. Um, Gordon Dewar has, has talked about some of the uh, economic analysis that's included in, in the written submission, and I just wanted to, to look at that. You've talked about the potential for additional revenues being generated for the public purse. Uh, I think you said for government coffers. You weren't clear which government you meant. Uh, You've, you've cited uh, value-added tax, only a proportion of which uh, is to be assigned in future to the, the Scottish Government. You've talked about corporation tax, um, which obviously is, is not devolved at all. Uh, you've talked about uh, savings from uh, the welfare bill, from the Social Security bill, which again is not devolved uh, and uh, seems uh, not to, to include any analysis of the proportion of people working in the aviation industry who are claimants uh, at the present time. And you've talked about employment taxes uh, uh, using uh, a study by Oxford Economics uh, from 2013-14, um, at which point obviously the personal allowance was significantly lower than it is now uh, and lower again than it's intended to be by the end uh, of the, the parliamentary session. Um, is it not clear that not only there's no uh, indication in your analysis of what proportion of the uh, purported additional revenues would come to the Scottish budget, uh, but also that you're relying on uh, research and, and studies that are woefully out of date uh, and can't be considered as a, a reliable forecast of the, the revenues that might come through those taxes that are devolved? Um, I, I I would welcome the request I heard earlier when I was sitting on the, on the back benches here about having the government do a full and frank uh, analysis of this. I think that has been missing for some time. Um, the fact that I'm using 13, 14 data is because I've been arguing this case for seven or eight years. Um, so we're a long way uh, away from where we started. So I think it would be fantastic because one of the accusations we get if we commission it, they would say that, wouldn't they? And I think that's unhelpful given that if nobody else commissions it, we're the only ones that did. They are, they are a very reputable company and they are independent in terms of their findings. But I think the right answer is that government brings forward a full analysis of the benefits of this revenue and economically. I hold up my hands. I've probably used the they would, wouldn't they response myself from time to time. Uh, but you would, you would agree, for example, just to, to, to boil it down, you've, uh, your, your written submission, uh, which does still cite the Oxford Economics uh, uh, research, uh, talks about generating 900 million in revenues from income tax and 1.3 billion in revenues from national insurance. National insurance clearly isn't devolved either. Um, if we're looking at a, a substantial gap between 9,440 as a personal allowance when that research was done and 12,500, uh, which the Scottish Government intends it to be by the end of the current Parliament, you would need to be looking at people earning significantly above 12,500 to generate any meaningful uh, income from uh, income tax from uh, theoretically generated employment. Uh, and, and we are talking about the tourism and hospitality sector, which are pretty notorious for poverty wages. I wouldn't agree with that second part of your comment, but um, I, I don't think it's for... You might for, if you were on minimum wage. Um, I'm, I'm very closely associated with uh, Visit Scotland and Scottish Tourism Alliance and understand the economics of tourism, and I think um, what they are is a very successful employer that's got lots of opportunity for growth. And are very but you would agree with the speeds. basic point that employment generated would have to be significantly above 12,500 in order to generate any income tax revenue. I would agree with the point that the analysis should be done by those that understand these things. Thank you. I, th I think, just, if I may just add one point, um, the average salaries certainly um, in, in Logan are almost double the level that you're talking about uh, across, the, uh, across the Highlands and Islands network. So in terms of any job creation within our organisation, uh, the salaries will be above that level. They are. I I'm, I'm perfectly to take, prepared to take your word for that. We are <coughs> mostly talking about induced employment in the wider economy, though hotels, tourism, you know, nightlife, all the rest. Okay, before, before
I'll move on to issues, Marie, and the, the, the rural issues you want to raise, and I think Liam did as well. Can I just clear this Chad matter up a bit more? <laughs> um, because I know that in FIFA rankings that Scotland's 67 and that Chad's 151st. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and I understand why that's arrived at. But so, who's come up with the analysis that says that Chad is um, the, the the highest in the world, and that Scot and the UK's second in there, and Scotland's in that? It's a World Economic Forum uh, study. They do a um, a study every two years on um, tourism uh, and air taxes and okay. airport charges, and we were 136 out of 137 countries. Chad was below us, but they didn't submit any figures, so it's conceivable that we could have been um, completely last. <laughs> <laughs> wow. OK, I'm really glad to ask that question now. OK, but it's... Most of the reason why we're so ineffective in terms of pricing in airports is all down to Heathrow, so that's... OK, that's but I think what we should do is get the clerks just to... Do a bit of, so we can source that as a, a proper thing for members to be aware of, because it's been mentioned a few times. Now, Marie. Thank you, Convener. And, um, I would have to say I would agree with the concerns expressed by the panel to characterise the tourist industry as entirely a low-wage economy. I think we'd be doing it a disservice. It's a vital industry in the part of the country that I represent. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, particularly, I'm very interested in your figures, about 25% of the passengers being, um, their fares being directly paid by um, two Highland and Island airports being directly paid by either government bodies or council or NHS. I wonder if I could get a little bit more detail around that. I don't need much convincing that these are lifeline um, flights coming from the Highlands and Islands. So could you give me a little bit more detail about that? Does that include staff going on training, for example, or um, participating in networking opportunities? I used to work for the NHS and I did um, regularly have to fly just simply to um, maintain my ability to do my job? Yes, it does include those categories. So we're able to take uh, the data of customers booking with us and uh, we can clearly identify those travelling under the NHS patient travel arrangements that we have in place, um, which uh, is around uh, 50,000 passengers a year out of the half million uh, that we carry within Scotland. Um, but then based on the information that the customer provides us when they book, such as an email address. If that's then registered to NHS, police, uh, councils, we're able to then ascertain from that information um, where that customer is effectively working uh, by the email address of the person who's booked the flight for them. Uh, and it's on the basis of that that we've come up with those figures. OK, so in fact, that may actually be an underestimate because I certainly myself booked flights using a personal email. It, it, it may, <laughs> yes. OK, thank you for that. I wonder if you could give me any numbers around, um, certainly from the submissions that, that uh, were received in the consultation, around um, whether all flights from the Highlands and Islands should be categorised as lifeline. There was some um, questioning of whether flights to sun and ski destinations from Inverness Airport should be included. Have you got any information, or have any of you got any information about what proportion of flights that might account for from Highland and Island airports? Small. If we look at the Highlands <laughs> and Islands airports' total throughput of their route network, which is around 1.1 uh, million uh, passengers a year, and that includes Inverness, um, Logan Air accounts for over half of their business. Um, and so, on the basis of that, then when you also look at the Inverness to uh, London uh, air services, which have grown significantly, uh, and the Inverness to Manchester and Dublin flights that we provide, I think the remaining level of services from Inverness to, uh, uh, if I can call them sun and ski destinations, is relatively small. Of course, it's something that they are trying to encourage to grow, um, and we support that because it brings down uh, the overall cost-sharing burden of running those airport facilities. Um, but uh, I think, uh, from memory, I think they have six flights this year to Mallorca. Uh, versus probably six a day from Gordon's got or something of that uh, that nature at, at, at the height of the season. So it is a, uh, a minuscule part of the uh, wider piece that we're looking at within the Highlands and Islands network. Thank you. And, and I also wanted to ask him just about alternative modes of transport. So you mentioned that all, was it all routes but one go over a body of water? And, and the one route that doesn't go over a body of water, would that be Wick to Edinburgh? It is indeed Wick to <laughs> Edinburgh, which, of course, as a journey, might as well be over a body of water, trying yeah. to get by surface transport, uh, given the alternatives, which is why, uh, why, why it still flies. So, um, yeah. Train journey, six-hour car journey. Yes, in, <laughs> indeed. So, I mean, we, we do have a direct com competition in terms of ferry services, and we do see a very direct interaction um, between ferries and air. So, for example... 
the road equivalent tariff introduced on uh, on ferries, that introduction of that to the uh, Isla market in 2012 has had a direct impact on the Glasgow to Isla air service, where, of course, passengers leaving Glasgow are paying air passenger duty on that, uh, and the ferry fares have been brought down through the introduction of RET. Um, so it's against that background that, uh, that we believe that really there are strong benefits uh, in now, uh, essentially through the form of aid of a social character, um, reciprocating that uh, 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 exemption that currently applies on the flights from the Highlands and Islands to flights departing from Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen to the Highlands and Islands from, uh, from the new tax. And did I understand correctly that you had done some climate change impact comparisons so that you were looking at flights, for example, did you do Glasgow to Isla and compare it with a single occupied car and ferry journey? We've, we've done some outline work, so I will not profess to say that it's uh, sort of a, a we've had a, a bevy of consultants working away in the background around this, but in terms of looking at the um, uh, average uh, emissions figures uh, generated by both CalMac but more particularly on the longer ferry route, Circo Northlink, which operates the North Isle services from uh, uh, Aberdeen and Scrabster. Um, that, uh, that, that is essentially, the longer the ferry journey, the worse the emissions get to that. And, uh, of course, ferries tend to depart from the closest point that they can sail from, which means that uh, normally, by implication, there's a long car journey to actually get to the ferry uh, in the vast majority of uh, areas in which we compete uh, with our services. Thank you. I think you had some questions around this area as well. Did I get that right? Or? Yeah, um, a number of questions. Uh, let me go to evidence, and specifically uh, the evidence submitted by Virgin Trains. Uh, there are some quite big claims in that evidence. Uh, around 33% uh, of the southbound rail market would switch to air if APD were abolished, for example. Uh, where, what evidence are you basing that on? What studies have been done to draw those conclusions, and how robust are they? So it's based on conventional uh, transport modelling, um, based on the information that we have available to us at the moment. Um, but I think the uh, clearly there are a range of outcomes um, that so all of the research that has been discussed today and discussed in each uh, item of the evidence, I think, does need some proper scrutiny, mm. um, a, a, as was mentioned. Uh, earlier, but we believe that the research that we have undertaken is robust. We know that rail competes strongly at the moment uh, with the aviation market. Uh, we know, for example, the initiatives that we have launched in the past year have been successful at attracting customers uh, from airlines to rail, in part, as well as boosting uh, Scotland's connectivity. So we know that the market is competitive, and that is why we are uh, extremely concerned that a reduction in the tax paid by uh, air passengers will result on these domestic routes in a switch from rail to air, and that will fundamentally undermine the case for further investment in, in the rail routes between uh, London and Scotland. But have you evidence, uh, have you taken robust evidence that suggests that uh, your customers are actively or are making an active choice to take the train uh, because they don't want to pay a £13 charge uh, such that if that charge were only £7 they would make an active choice to do something different? So we have evidence that Customers do compare the price of the uh, choice of the modes that they have, as well as, of course, factors like the journey time and the connectivity, whether they want to uh, go to uh, a Heath, uh, Heathrow, for example, and then make the journey uh, into the city centre or go directly to the city centre. So customers consider a number of things, and we absolutely know that price is one factor. Uh, yes, that but is I'm why asking about the 50%. Yes, yeah, so, reduction. I mean, so, so, so clearly, when you're doing transport modelling, um, the the prices of alternative modes are, are aggregated. So, you will look at the the cost um, that a passenger would pay for the airfare, including the taxes, and you would compare that with the rail fare. And uh, so, we have applied the reduction uh, in, in in our analysis. We've applied the reduction proposed to the tax element, and the results that we've shared. Uh, reflect uh, reflect that effect. Right. So, uh, just to reflect back what I think you're saying to me, that uh, it is your conclusion that if the airlines were suddenly able to display a £7 reduction in their fare, that would cannibalise 33% of your 
Rail market. So, so that is on a seven pound. On, on the South Bone Road, that, that, that is what our research uh, to date have found. Right. And what do the airlines say about that? Ross, that, as, a, as an ex-public transport modeller and rail operator, I've never seen the elasticities of anything of that scale in terms of impact. So I don't recognise where the numbers come from or, or how that's plausible. But, but here's the thing. I'm, I'm really happy to be in a competitive market and we'll stand on the customer service we offer and the choices we offer. It's, it's a bit galling when a heavily subsidised industry is asking for their competitors to be taxed to be competitive. <laughs> Can you just comment on that, just for the avoidance of doubt? Our services between London and Scotland are not subsidised. Uh, this year we pay £280 million in premium uh, to the government, I think on a per passenger basis that actually equates to slightly more than airlines pay under the band A for each uh, aviation passenger. Real cost. <laughs> the debate between you guys, be, I get enough debate to control between the politicians. Um, um, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a few folk who will ask supplementary, so you'll get another chance, because I've got another three folk who want to contribute in the, tra in the train area. So Murdoch, Willie, and then Neil in that order, I think, in terms of Murdoch. OK, thank you, uh, Convener. Sorry, yes. Liam, did you finish? No, I just All right. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, <laughs> okay. no, well, my sincere apologies. On you go. If I may. I just wanted to turn uh, the figures uh, onto Mr. Dewar, uh, because you talk about in, in your submission uh, that uh, uh, the impact of a reduction in APD could be an extra 18 million passengers being flown from Scotland. Uh, where are those, on your analysis, where are those passengers coming from? And where are they going to? So they're largely driven. These incremental passengers are driven by a bit of um, just economic uplift, and because of that, that's, that cost reduction will generate some outbound Scottish-based travel. But that's very modest. And if we look at if we look at what's happening in a growing market at the moment, we are pretty flat on domestic travel, for example. But we're up at 20% growth in, in international travel. Um, some of that's outbound, but the majority of all these new routes are inbound because we're making people it making it easy for people to come to Scotland for the first time. So m the vast majority of that is international-based inbound travel that's coming through the attraction. And that's driven not by a £6.50 or a £37.50 reduction in the fare price, although some of that will contribute. It's driven by the fact that more routes can start because they become economically and financially viable for airlines to do so. And it, just on that point, because your submission uh, makes a number of suggestions about the economic impact, positive economic impact of this change. but. Logically, you would have gone on to say, well, there'll be a negative or a potential negative impact on the train service and the supply chain to the trains and the jobs associated with that. Is that yeah. analysis being done? I, I think there's, there's definitely a different impact in different segments of the market. Um, I think it, it's a natural thing to say that if you've got a well-established, mature, competed market, in this case with rail in terms of domestic, that the opportunity for economic growth out of that is lessened. Whereas if you open up long-haul markets where they've had no real um, attractive proposition to come to Scotland, then I think you'll see massive increase in that. And Europe sits fairly in the, in the middle, but of course Europe's critical because it's such a massive pool of existing and future travel, whereas long haul can grow at very high percentages but will never be a huge part of their total. Mm -hmm. So the real win is going where people genuinely can not make easy or affordable access to Scotland. And when we do it, we see them responding in huge numbers. On average, when we have a connection that's gone from indirect, i.e. you have to fly through London or through Amsterdam or through, uh, through Paris or whatever, we would typically see between a three and four multiple increase in the number of people making that trip, which is pretty heroic in the first place. So, you know, we know that's strong and that's the average. For example, when, we, when EasyJet started up a Hamburg route, where obviously it's not very far away in distance and therefore travel time, but it was really inconvenient to get to via one of the hubs that, as it used to be, the, they actually increased um, travel between Hamburg area and Scotland tenfold, and 80% of that was Germans coming to Scotland. I, I just, I wonder then if going forward there's an argument for disaggregating the conversation away from, at the moment it seems to me we're talking about uh, reduction in APD or changing it across the board, uh, when in fact what we should be doing is talking about international air travel and then uh, having some regard to the, the alternative travel structures and what we do with that. Uh, but on that point, I just wonder 
do we need to be thinking in a more sophisticated way from an airline point of view and from an airport's point of view uh, in terms of what we do going forward in relation to stimulating the more northerly airports where perhaps there are fewer alternatives. Uh, so rather than talking about a blanket reduction in APD, do we need to start talking about, you know, perhaps Edinburgh Airport takes, takes a hit, but Aberdeen Airport uh, gets a 0% APD? Um, well, I could start at the legal end of that discussion <laughs> um, and, and tell you that you wouldn't be able to achieve that under the existing legislation. But um, I, I think I think we should we should let we should let the we should let the economy speak. What we're seeing is that Scotland, led by Edinburgh at the moment, but that's because we're competing and because we're putting service out there and we're putting pricing offers out there to airlines are being effective. There's nothing to stop our competitors um, competing and they do so very aggressively. Um, but we should we should back a winning agenda. And the winning agenda here is not Edinburgh Airport. The winning agenda is the Scottish economy, Scottish tourism industry as a whole, and the education sector. The largest driver of, of passengers in Edinburgh these days is education. Uh, and that's us exporting as well as people coming in. So effectively, we, are, we have got a hugely strong market. We should create the economic conditions, allow that to flourish. I think too much tampering, one gets into complexity and actually starts to undermine the value of it, and secondly starts um, playing with things that you know you probably don't have as much control as you'd like to have, and I include myself in that. You, you have to acknowledge that the market will speak, and therefore just putting ourselves, not about the trying to play the game between up the A9 or across the M8, but actually we are trying to get into a competitive environment against the rest of Europe and the world. That's the reality. This is not about how we manage what's in within Scotland is how we make people want to come to Scotland in the first place. So, you know, if you, if, if you, if you made it free in Inverness, oh, it is already, um, that hasn't had the impact that says all of the airlines are going to pile into Inverness in the, in the exception of Edinburgh. What it has said is making Edinburgh £13 as they all go to Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and under, right. just on, on that okay. point, under uh, current EU law, uh, as long as we're a member of the European Union, um, it would in fact be uh, illegal under EU state aid guidelines to uh, reduce APD uh, for, for one airport over another, uh, as long as it was within, I think, about 60 miles. So um, the UK government has looked at this uh, across the whole of the, the UK uh, in response to this uh, actual debate, and uh, it does pose a number of very, very challenging legal uh, issues, which is why they've so far shied away from it. Okay, um, can I get back to trains, if that's all right? Because, uh, and thank you for that contribution, uh, um, because I think you, you'd initially wanted to raise trains at one stage as well, Tim, so that would give us a chance to get back there. Yeah. Um, Murdo. Okay, thank you. Perhaps I, I could go back to, to David Horn and just follow up some of the early questioning about trains. Um, I mean, I personally, I would have thought it was self-evident that anything that affects the cost competitiveness of trains versus airlines is bound to depress the number of journeys on trains. Um, and I think we'd be interested in hearing more about you know, your specific evidence about the claims you're making about reductions. But uh, let me just move on a little bit, if I can, because you know, we're looking at the policy that the Scottish Government's policy intent is a 50% reduction in APD, but they've not specified whether that's an across-the-board reduction or whether that should be a split, or how that might be split against a band A or band B, or indeed whether these bands will be retained or whether some other new band would be introduced. So the question I've got for Mr Horn is, from the point of view of, of um, Virgin Rail, if the reduction in APD was targeted, say, at long haul, which has been proposed, is that something that would satisfy your concerns if uh, domestic flights were left with APD at current levels? In simple terms, yes, it would. Our, our concerns are entirely relating to uh, the domestic routes where we do compete strongly uh, with air. Uh, absolutely uh, welcome uh, Scotland's continued uh, outlook uh, internationally. You know, clearly we all want Scotland uh, to thrive. We benefit from uh, a strong Scotland in terms of our core market. Scotland's so important to us as a business. And if Scotland can attract more international flights through this policy, uh, then of course it's good for Scotland. We would absolutely support it. What our, con our concern is absolutely that the Reducing APD on domestic routes would simply achieve a modal uh, switch and that would be damaging in terms of environmental policy objectives, for example, as was touched on earlier, as well as uh, economic objectives because of the loss of connectivity that would result 
in the medium to long term. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is you see a potential reduction in long haul only as complementary to the provision of rail travel, and therefore that could actually have an economic benefit by bringing more people to Scotland who might then use rail services whilst they're in the UK. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. There's one more question, if I can, because there's a... There's a um, can, can, oh, sorry. Tim. Tim. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we're comparing like with like. Um, you're comparing uh, Edinburgh or Glasgow down to, to, to London. Um, you know, our short-haul domestic carriers, you know, you, you look at an airline like Flybe, most of their services are Exeter to Aberdeen or Exeter to Newcastle or, or, or Norwich to, to, to Aberdeen. Um, you know, it's very, very unlikely that someone is going to get trained to, 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 to run those services. So um, I, I, I completely buy um, the argument that you're making in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 the straight journey from Edinburgh to, to, to London. Um, but if you're looking to pr uh, promote domestic connectivity from Scotland to uh, secondary uh, regions and cities in the rest of the UK, um, then I would argue that reducing uh, short haul by 50% is going to have an, Im an impact on that. Also, um, by reducing APD on short haul, you are making it easier um, to... Uh, it, it, the argument doesn't, doesn't take any... Uh, 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 in terms of interlining through London, um, this doesn't have any impact on that whatsoever. Um, you know, you're talking about the you're going from A to B, Edinburgh to Glasgow to London. Uh, if you're interlining through Heathrow to go to the States, you're not. It's, it's very unlikely that you're going to go into Euston Station and then get another train through to Heathrow. You're going to go via Heathrow to interline out of uh, Heathrow. So that, that's my argument around the trains and the, and, and the planes. Um, that's yeah, yeah I, I get that. But, of course, connecting flights to an international flight would be exempt. From which from which airport? Well, all airports. I mean, if I'm if I'm flying Aberdeen or Edinburgh to um, you know, San Francisco, no, you'd, you'd pay. And I, and so I, if, I, if you were going from Edinburgh to uh, New York, for example, you would pay, and you were interlining. Sorry. So as I understand the, the, the legislation, it is your point of destination that you pay your APD on. So if I'm flying to San Francisco from Edinburgh, via, whether it's via Heathrow or wherever it's via, I, don't pay, I wouldn't pay APD if the policy was to scrap APD for long haul only. If, if the policy is to scrap APD, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Currently, you would pay APD on the long, on the long haul rate. Yeah, yeah. fine. fine. I was, one more question um, for, for Mr Horn first. There's a headline in a, in a Scottish newspaper today that says this, uh, and I might be paraphrasing slightly, Richard Branson on collision course with Scottish Government over APD, which I think refers to Virgin Trains' evidence to this committee. Um, however, Virgin Atlantic, I'm assuming, who are a member of Mr Aldersdale's organisation, uh, will take a different view. Perhaps he could confirm that. I'm just wondering, do we know what Mr Branson thinks, or is he in two minds on the issue? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, a bit of background um, for the uh, for the committee. So, uh, Virgin Trains East Coast is a joint venture between uh, the Virgin Group and Stagecoach Group, 90% uh, owned by Stagecoach Group. Uh, the views that we are putting forward are our own views as a company, um, and uh, clearly, um, uh, both of our shareholders have wider interests. Um, and, but we are very much today. Uh, and in the submissions that we've made, uh, been putting forward our views and our analysis that we've undertaken as a company. Uh, does Tim wish to respond? And um, <laughs> <Mr. Atlantic>? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we uh, it will no, come as no surprise to you uh, to learn that we represent both short haul, long haul uh, domestic carriers. So. Uh, we're not, I'm not going to get into a discussion around, uh, around the bandings um, or, or the Virgin Group. Um, we, uh, as, as we've said, we want to see the 50% reduction across, across both bands. And uh, I think I might leave it there before I get into trouble. Well so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> Willie. Um, as an Ayrshire MSP, I'm, I'm really interested in the potential beneficial effect of this policy and somewhere like Presswick. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate to be at a meeting in Dublin the day before the Irish government abolished the rear passenger tax, and Michael O'Leary was at the same meeting, who immediately the day after announced a series of investments, major investments in Dublin and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Gordon, you'd said, I think quite rightly, that the winning agenda is for Scotland and tourism, so I'm interested as a West of Scotland MSP in what the potential regional benefits will be 
for somewhere like Prestwick. And is there any evidence that points us towards that, say elsewhere in Europe, that regional airports in particular countries and jurisdictions do get a spin-off benefit from policies like this? I, I think the, the, the straightforward answer is every airport that sees a reduction in tax is going to improve their chances of growth. Um, and that's, that's probably the best way I can put it. Um, it probably doesn't help me giving you my view on Presswick's possibility of achieving that. But, um, you know, it, it is a massive drag. I mean, what I would say is we are generously provided for, for why good airports in the centre of Scotland and actually very well provided for in the Highlands and Islands as well. So the opportunity to harness that um, asset base and the enthusiasm and um, capability of the management teams around Scotland is there if we just take the handcuffs off. Because some of the displacement that occurred can be there came from Presswick to Glasgow, where I, particularly where I am here with the Dublin flights from Presswick. And that, in my view, if we were to have this measure, and O'Leary promised himself that if this measure were to come in, that he could double the passenger numbers at Presswick from a million to about two and a half million. He made that quite clear commitment on record. So if, if that kind of policy were, were to happen for an airport like Presswick, that would, in my view, surely have a huge and beneficial impact in the, the Ayrshire economy. I think there is some fairly clear evidence in Ireland following the abolition of the APD equivalent that the regional airports do benefit. Um, and, um, you know, it hasn't just Dublin has, has grown by 40% over the last three years in terms of traffic levels there. But I think it's also very clear that there are additional links now into Cork, Shannon, Kerry, you know, a wide range of points. But uh, at the same time as that, Derry, which is uh, subject to UK air passenger duty, is losing its sole remaining air service to London, and the government is having to step in to do that because it is still, still subject to the APD. So I think there is a, the, 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 the model of what has happened in Ireland and the impact on the immediate periphery around that is something which I think would be uh, a good benchmark for further scrutiny into the likely effects of the uh, uh, Scottish proposals. And in Northern Ireland, um, and Belfast International only retained its United New York service because they, they abolished the APD for it. So that was the difference between keeping that route from being cancelled. Okay. Yeah. just wanted to go back to the, the, the issue of um, potentially encouraging air travel within the UK at the expense of, of, of rail travel. Um, looked at an example yesterday of, of travelling in a couple of weeks' time from, from Edinburgh to London and uh, you could get a Ryanair flight from Edinburgh to Stansted, um, and even including travel from Edinburgh city centre to Edinburgh and including a train journey from Stansted Airport to uh, London uh, city centre, it came in at a £63. And um, on the same days, there was a Virgin train from, from Edinburgh be costing £115 return. Now, I appreciate so, you know, Virgin East Coast do special offers and £20 returns and sales, etc. But it does, any time I've looked at you know, travelling options between Edinburgh and London or, or Glasgow and, and London, it does seem frequently that it's cheaper to get a, a flight than it is to take the train. And it's really just to ask why, why, why is that? And, and you know, is, is, why, is, why is rail travel so expensive between Scotland and the rest of the UK? And is that not something that needs to be looked at in general, irrespective of our position on APD? If we want to increase uh, rail travel, we've got to make it more affordable for people uh, to go from Glasgow to London or uh, Edinburgh to London by train. I, th I think we would say that it's absolutely important that rail travel is affordable between Scotland and London, and that's absolutely what we've been seeking to achieve over the past two years since we've been operating the East Coast route. Last year, we expanded our services. So between Edinburgh and London, there's now a half-hourly service. You don't get a half-hourly service to Stansted with Ryanair. Um, and the half-hourly service enabled us to offer many more thousand um, uh, cheaper tickets um, uh, on the route each week. So um, we are absolutely addressing the affordability uh, point, and it is clearly important uh, to our market. Um, absolutely, what you know, we are offering a different proposition uh, and seeking to offer a different proposition to airlines. We're trying to take people uh, between city centres uh, to cut out the journey uh, both to and from airports, and indeed the the uh, uh, the experience that people have uh, these days go, getting through airport security, for example. Um, our focus is on providing high-quality frequent service 
uh, where on board people can work. We, we, we have free Wi-Fi. We have entertainment systems on board between Scotland and London as well. So we're, we're, we, we are attracting people uh, through the customer experience as well as price, and I fully agree with you that price is absolutely uh, important as well. I, I, I don't really want to get into debate between rail and air on whether or not who's giving the best deals, <laughs> because that's not really about the bill. But I, I think you're probably going somewhere with this, Neil, in terms of the end of that. It was just, I would, you know, it was just to, to explore the, the reasons why why rail travel currently is more expensive okay. than, 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 than okay. air travel on a, on a lot of occasions. Okay. Patrick, I think you're uh, yeah, um, to this area as well. Just to, to just clarify... Before you start, I, I really need to make sure, because time's marching on a bit, but I need to get the public finances issue and what James wants to raise on the agenda before we... We haven't touched on climate change I know, yet. I, I know climate change is still to come into the world. Okay. I assume you're going to pick uh, up on some of that just now as well. Well, I, I can I can deal with that now if, if you'd like. I, I was just going to follow up on, on one issue from Mr Horn's uh, written submission, and it is just about understanding clearly... Uh, the, the implications of, of what you're saying. Uh, you said that, um, obviously, you, uh, as, as a business, you've got no objection to uh, increased international aviation coming to Scotland, but you're concerned about the environmental impacts of a modal shift uh, away from rail within domestic flights. I think we're half on the same page. I'm concerned about the environmental impacts of both. Is your analysis of the modal shift that you're predicting predicated on the Scottish Government only uh, reducing APD or the equivalent tax on domestic aviation, and if the UK Government responded in kind by having a similar tax cut south of the border uh, on domestic aviation uh, in the other direction, would that increase the modal shift that you're projecting? So we haven't... Uh, mind, I will... We will confirm this to you separately if I'm wrong, but my, uh, my understanding is our analysis is purely uh, regarding changes that the Scottish Government would take. Actually, going back to a po an earlier point about our analysis, the reduction of 33% is uh, the impact we have assessed based on an abolition um, of, of, of uh, ADT. Uh, on Edinburgh to London, rather okay. than the 50% reduction. But yes, we haven't assumed anything in relation to how the UK government may respond. It would be reasonable to assume that if the UK government was to respond by implementing the same kind of cut on APD, on domestic uh, travel, uh, from, from their angle, from their perspective, it would have a similar impact on the attractiveness of rail in general for those long, uh, th those, uh, those uh, domestic uh, connections uh, and on, for example, the, the value of the franchise were it put out to, to tender again. Yeah, it would clearly have a further impact and that would need to be assessed. Thank you. Do you want me to touch on the climate change? Just, just before we let me explain a point. I, I know that David Horn had real issues in terms of time. David, are your time scales, are you OK now? Because I, I think midday was your original position yeah, you no, need to be away happy by. Happy to, to stay. That's OK, you're happy to stay. Might as well do. Uh, uh, James, are you, I, I was going to bring you in. Are you content if we just get on now to oh, climate change? Sorry. Okay, just so I'm <laughs> managing this properly. Right, Thank climate you. change. Um, the uh, most recent commitment that I could see from the aviation industry uh, is from a, a number of years ago, 2009, uh, committing in international negotiations uh, to halve uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, I'm assuming that this means. Uh, overall climate change impact, but it says CO2 emissions, by 2050. Uh, can the aviation industry representatives tell me whether that is still the commitment of the industry uh, and whether this approach to a new tax is compatible with achieving that goal uh, in terms of Scottish aviation? Uh, yes, so um, aviation has signed up to uh, global targets uh, from... Uh, 2020 uh, carbon neutral growth um, and uh, f uh, by 2050 a uh, 50 percent reduction uh, in co2 emissions uh, based on 2005 uh, levels so uh, I can give you that assurance uh, that is still the uh, the commitment that, that is a voluntary um, commitment from from the industry uh, so, so I can give you that assurance thank you that's that's very clear can can you explain to me how the increase in aviation levels that you're aiming to see as a result of uh, the Scottish Government's policy in this area is compatible with halving emissions from aviation by 2050? 
Um, the, the industry working through sustainable aviation um, has uh, predicted that uh, if you look at uh, demand forecast, that's going to go up by uh, around about 50% up to 2050. Uh, we can comply um, with our climate change commitments and still meet that additional uh, increase in passenger numbers uh, through a, a variety of uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, so we can absolutely, uh, the, the increase in Scottish flights will be relatively small compared to the increase that we're going to see uh, both in, in terms of the UK and globally, uh, but through a, a, a variety of mechanisms, we can see an increase in passenger numbers and whilst reducing our emissions and hitting our global target. So there shouldn't be any objection then, sorry, uh, just to, to follow that up, there shouldn't be then any objection then uh, to locking in that requirement for Minister to achieve that impact on aviation emissions when they set the rates and bans uh, of this tax? Um, I mean, it's not something that I've given uh, great, great thought to. Um, all I can say is that as a, as a global industry, they're the commitments that we've made. Uh, you know, we've made them now for a number of years, um, and we're absolutely we're on target to hit them. And by 2050, we'd like to see a reduction by 50% by on 2005 levels. And we are, we are now seeing, uh, as a result of the measures that we're taking, we are now starting to see emissions come down. Can I come back on that? Uh, uh, if, if I may, I, th I think the, the, the primary method through which those emissions will be achieved is the adoption of new technology, um, and in particular improved engine technology um, within the industry, which will bring the fuel burn down. Um, I think the other point, particularly in respect of, of, of our business uh, in, within the Highlands and Islands, is that operating uh, with a, a lower cost base will allow us to increase the number of passengers. That will probably be initially done through operation of larger aircraft which per passenger carried will still generate the growth but have a lower emission per passenger um, through economies of scale by operating larger aircraft. So I do think it, that there's no contradiction here um, between uh, reducing or abolishing ADT and continuing to see reductions uh, in emissions because the industry, hugely cutthroat place to operate, will continue to adopt new technology uh, all the way through that because it has to remain competitive. Um, the one thing we can't guarantee with any certainty is around the uh, price of aviation fuel. So airlines will always make every effort to try and minimise their level of aviation fuel burn uh, and run their business as efficiently as possible, um, which is consistent with minimising the emissions that we, bur that we generate by burning that same fuel. Without wanting to get into a, a technical discussion about the achievability of this, which would take a very long time, and, and we might you know, not end up agreeing by the end of it anyway, um, the, the confidence that you're suggesting exists, not just on increasing efficiency, but on halving emissions compared with that target, uh, overall emissions, not just efficiency. Uh, the confidence you're, you're saying that you have in that surely would, would leave us with no problem at all in placing a legal requirement on ministers to achieve that impact when they set the rates and bans of this tax. I, th I think... First of all, it, it, there is a level of um, global impact around the whole question. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the other question is, if, if you don't achieve that, what, what mechanism are you going to use to recover the ADT that hasn't been collected from customers over the period of that time? I'm struggling to see how what you're proposing, while I understand the rationale behind it, could actually be practically uh, be put into practice for if over the course of... 10 or 15 years, passengers have been charged either no ADT or a reduced level of ADT. But then at the end of that time, the industry hasn't met its, um, hasn't met its target. How could you realistically go to each and every customer retrospectively with a send the captain's hat round for a whip round to collect the tax that you haven't collected? It, it, I, I, I can't I understand how the concept of driving that would work. What I've suggested is a requirement on ministers uh, to uh, ensure that the rates and taxes, rates and bans of of tax that they propose are compatible with that uh, objective that the industry seems confident it's on track to achieve. Say that these are uh, these are global targets. Um, obviously, aviation is an international uh, industry, so mm. uh, we can't look at these targets in a Scotland-specific uh, way. Um, and the Committee on Climate Change has been quite clear that uh, uh, action to tackle emissions needs to be uh, taken globally mm. uh, or regionally. And uh, looking at it yeah. purely from a Scottish perspective, um, I don't think is, is, is quite a blunt instrument. Um, Glo if I may say globally so. means by everyone rather than by someone else. Gordon Drew has been quite eager to get in as well, Patrick. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just the observation that while this is utterly crucial for us, we, we should get carried away by what impact this is going to have on the global aviation industry. This is a market share play. 
EasyJet have got fleet orders, Ryanair have got fleet orders, they're not going to order more aircraft because Scotland has reduced HBD. What we're going to do is we're going to take the same aircraft away from other European countries. This is a market share play simply by getting down towards the levels of tax that others charge, which is largely nothing. So effectively we're not going to have any net impact on, on, on emissions as a result of this. There will be of course some marginal additional travel, but fundamentally this is a market share play. And one of the other benefits of doing um, direct services, which is what we're going to get out of that is we avoid the very, very inefficient hubbing through other airports. Just to clarify, you're saying there will be no net emissions impact from the Scottish Government's policy on halving and then abolishing APD? I'm saying in global terms it will be extremely small. I think the, the Climate Committee said it was 0.1% impact of doing the, of this, and I think that was an abolition call that they put on it as well. So utterly manageable, because the vast majority of what happens as a result of this is you take aircraft that were going to be assigned to Spain, Italy or Germany, and you assign them to Scotland. There is no net impact on what that aircraft emits. As we're yet to hear the environmental impact assessment from the government, it, it seems that everybody's unclear whether it's small or not non-existent, but let's wait and see. Our members have invested in... Um, Patrick sorry. was just making a statement. He wasn't, making a, he sure. wasn't asking a question. So uh, there's no, if we just start making statements back and forward, we're not, we're not going to get anywhere. So for, for, forgive me. Um, so let's, can we get on to the public finances issues now? And James, please. OK, in the interest of time, convener, I'll try and boil this down to one question. Um, we heard in the previous uh, session discussion about the potential impact on public finances. Um, obviously, the objective of this is a 50% reduction in ADT by, 2000 and, by the end of 2021. The financial memorandum shows that OBR forecasts for APD revenue, if there were no change, uh, would for, for the Scottish uh, element of that would be 378 million in 2020-2021. So therefore, a 50% reduction could mean, you know, up to a reduction in nearly 200 million pounds in the Scottish budget. In those circumstances, um, the budget then becomes about, you know, choices uh, in terms of the, the choices, the priorities that people have to make. Um, do you think it's right, therefore, um, if there was a reducing budget, given everything else that's going on, that a council uh, would not be able to pay a care worker employed in a care home a living wage, whereas a couple on a joint income of £60,000 would be able to enjoy a reduction in their airline tickets? The strongest answer I can give to that is to refer to the point I was making about the economic effects in Ireland. Where this has been done, it has been proven. And that is an economy with a strong tourism base, exactly the same as Scotland. So there will be economic evidence to draw on, rather than just being a, a, a leap of faith into the deep end of the swimming pool uh, before these decisions are taken. And I would strongly uh, encourage some benchmarking to be done uh, in terms of the wider economic impact that that's had in Ireland from doing exactly the same thing as is being proposed here. I think that will take the guesswork, the uncertainty uh, out of the whole, uh, whole equation, uh, particularly in respect to the committee of ministers taking this ultimate decision. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo that. I mean, as I said earlier, it would be really helpful to get one baseline model that people can sort of trust from independent resources. I think the evidence that if you look at within the whole UK, that both the economic growth is unchallengeably positive, and I think the revenue to the, the state, if we call it that for the moment, and with the combination of Scottish and UK, is positive as well. I'm not even going to step into the equation about how you then reconcile that between Scotland and the UK governments. But effectively, there is, you know, to me as a as a UK and Scottish resident, that's wooden dollars. I know that's not the way it actually is reality in terms of the way the government is run in Scotland. But this is this is one of the best investments you're ever going to see. This is not a tax cut and a giveaway. This is a huge investment. And if you listen to the, uh, the tourism industry, are entirely neutral in aviation per se. They are saying that if you wanted to hit the 2020 tourism targets, one of the biggest economic engines Scotland's got in front of it, the, the most important single thing you could do is follow through on the stated policy of having APD. Even if that means that um, care, care workers working in care homes aren't able to be paid the living wage? 
I don't think it does mean that. And what I'm calling for is someone to have a look at the data and see where the implications are. I think within the UK, it's undoubtedly going to be revenue generative. I would hope that you're very close to that, even at the Scottish dimension. But I'm not a tax expert, and I can't do the modelling for the civil service for them. Um, but I think the economic benefit, so even if there's a lag in that overall benefit for Scotland, it will the, the economic wider thing of having more people employment, uh, better standards of living, and everything else that goes with that says that this is one of the best investments facing it. A policy question for the Minister to be to ask and, and we, uh, understand where James is coming from. We so completely agree. I think uh, in the interests of uh, transparency for, for all of us on, on both sides of this argument that the Scottish Government investing not a huge amount of money in an uh, economic study I think would be very, very beneficial. I think we've come probably to the end of that particular evidence session, so I thank very much the individuals who come along today to give us evidence in, in, uh, as part of our consideration of the Air Departure Tax Bill. Um, I, I guess I'll be paying a lot more attention to the comparisons between Chad and Scotland in future <laughs> and a lot, a lot more areas. Uh, I now close this uh, public part of the meeting. We move into private.